It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hey, it's Monday, it's Patrick Christie's, it's GB News. So let's stick a rocket up the news agenda, shall we? Brand new homes for refugees. Councils are spending millions of pounds buying or building properties for those fleeing conflict. But what about British people already on housing waiting lists? Should the money be spent on Brits first? That's what I want to know. And a body has been found in the river. Now, if it's Nicola Bully, have Lancashire police been vindicated or are you still raging at the cock-ups that they've made? How could so many people not find a body? Prince Harry is costing you and me 300 grand because he's demanding police protection when he's in the UK. Can't Netflix pay for it, Harry? Or Mummy's Trust Fund? Maybe he wouldn't need protection if he hadn't insulted so many ordinary Brits. And now all of those cancel culture snowflakes have come for Roll Dahl. He can't call Augustus Gloop fat, apparently. Now he's just enormous. Well, no, he's a massive, greedy fatty. Fatty, fatty, bum, bum. The world's gone mad, hasn't it? Oh, actually, you can't say that anymore either. GB Views at GBNews.uk. I want to know, should we house Brits first? That's in light of that story about council spending millions to get new homes for refugees. But right now, it's your latest headlines. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB Newsroom. President Biden has promised more than $500 million worth of aid to Ukraine after making a surprise trip to its capital. It comes just days before the first anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Mr Zelensky said the visit was an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians. The US president said his country would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Putin thought Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. As you know, Mr. President, I said to you in the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. He thought he could outlast us. I don't think he's thinking that right now. God knows what he's thinking, but I don't think he's thinking that. The partner of missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, has spoken of the family's agony after a body was found yesterday in the river near to where she went missing. Lancashire police are working to provide a formal identification of the body, which was found in the water around a mile from where Nicola was last seen. 
They're currently treating the death as unexplained. The 45-year-old disappeared more than three weeks ago whilst walking her dog. More than 11,000 healthcare workers from the GMB and Unite unions in England and Wales are walking out today in their continuing dispute over pay and staffing. The workers striking include ambulance workers, paramedics and call handlers. GMB says it's over a month since the government engaged in meaningful dialogue. Elsewhere, the result of a ballot of around 45,000 junior doctors is expected to be announced later today by the British Medical Association. It is upsetting because we don't do this job to not help people. We do it because we want to help people. That's all we want to do. And you come in and, and you feel like you're not doing a job because you're not given the opportunity to. It's incredibly difficult because you feel so awful for these people knowing that there's, you've done everything within your power to help them but there's nothing more that you can provide. There's no, there's no answers to where is my ambulance because there isn't one at the moment. The Foreign and Northern Ireland secretaries are to speak with the European Commission Vice President later as negotiations continue over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Number 10 has denied reports the Prime Minister has been forced to delay announcing a breakthrough amid backlash from his own MPs. The DUP and backbench Tories say it won't support a deal which retains oversight from the European Court of Justice. Labour leader Sakir Starmer says there's a real window of opportunity to move forward. The UK and the EU have obviously edged closer together. The question now is whether the Prime Minister is strong enough to get it through his own backbenchers. Um, and what I've said is, um, on Northern Ireland, the national interest comes first. So we will put party politics to one side. We will vote with the government if there's a deal to vote for. And so the Prime Minister doesn't have to rely on his backbenchers. Um, you know, we in the Labour Party are putting country first and party second. Most dangerous domestic abusers will be added to the sex offender register as the Home Office vows to treat violence against women as a national threat. The government plans to invest up to £8.4 million over the next two years to fund specialist support programmes for victims. Domestic abuse affected around 2.4 million people in England and Wales in the past year. Home Secretary Suella Braverman says the changes are needed. I'm changing the law to ensure that there's more robust monitoring of perpetrators. We're introducing measures to ensure that we will be able to tag uh, offenders of domestic abuse. Uh, and we will be also adding uh, offenders of domestic abuse onto the violent and sex offenders register. Uh, and also, all police chiefs uh, and forces around the country will now be put on a footing to deal with violence against women and girls as a national threat. Finance Secretary Kate Forbes has announced her bid to become the new leader of the SNP and First Minister of Scotland. It's after Nicola Sturgeon's unexpected resignation last week. Former SNP Westminster leader Angus Robertson has ruled himself out of the leadership race, saying it's not the right time for him and his family. Scotland's Health Secretary Hamza Yousaf has already confirmed he will run, as will former Community Safety Minister Ash Regan. The new SNP leader will be announced on the 27th of March. This is GB News. More from me shortly. Now, though, it's back to Patrick Christie's. Yes, thank you, Tamsin. Welcome along, everybody. Patrick Christie's here on GB News. Now, the big email call-out that I'm going to do for you today, we'll be returning to this topic throughout the course of this show, gbviews at gbnews.uk, is pretty straightforward. Should we house Brits first? It's in light of numerous reports coming out from numerous different councils who are set to spend millions either building new homes or buying homes to house refugees, primarily from Ukraine and Afghanistan. There are, of course, loads of people on housing waiting lists. There are people already here who clearly need housing. Where do you stand on that? Some people are saying, well, where else do we put them? A lot of people saying, well, actually, this is money that should be used to house Brits first. That's the question for you today. Should we house Brits first? GBviews at gbnews.uk. But our top story today... Well, that's that the partner of the missing mum, Nicola Bully, has described his agony after a body was found in the River Wire in Lancashire, close to where she went missing. Now, the body 
which has not yet been identified, was discovered on Sunday morning, and it's prompted fresh questions about the effectiveness and competence of the police operation. Well, this morning, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, said that she had some concerns about the release of personal information of Nicola Bully. I believe we can have a look and a listen for that now. I did have concerns earlier in the week about uh, some of the elements rela relating to the release of personal information uh, of Nicola Bully into the public domain. I raised those concerns with the Chief Constable. I wasn't wholly satisfied, I have to say, with some of the responses I got, but it is a matter for the police themselves. There are some investigations ongoing, looking into uh, how the investigation has been handled, and we must let that uh, carry out uh, its own process. Well, what do we all make of this, ladies and gentlemen? Have Lancashire police now been completely vindicated? They were adamant, weren't they, that Nicola was in the river? We'll have to wait and see, of course, as that body is identified. But we had Peter Falding on earlier. He was copying it a little bit. He's the head of the independent dive unit, and they were saying, well, you were adamant that she wasn't in there, that there was nobody in there whatsoever. But I just cannot understand how, with the combined resources, especially those, frankly, of the police, with manpower both on the ground and in the water, it has taken this long to retrieve a body. But we're going to get the facts and where we are as things currently stand in this case that has gripped the nation, been gripping the nation now for over three weeks. And then I'm going to talk to a police expert as well to get his take on it. But right now we can cross live to our GB News North West of England reporter, Sophie Reaper. Sophie, thank you very much. So, yes, where are we at now then with proceedings? Well, currently, we know that a body had been recovered. Uh, there was major police presence here in St Michael's on wire yesterday. And then Lancashire police informed us that a body had indeed been recovered from the river wire as part of the investigation into Nicola Bully's disappearance. Um, you mentioned that we don't know for definite yet whether it is the mother of two. Formal identification is still underway. And we're waiting to hear from Lancashire police one way or or another. Of course, this has been a highly controversial investigation from the very beginning. We've seen uh, issues ac across the board. There was a dispersal unit because of armchair detectives. There was that release of private information about Nicola Bully that was uh, seen a, a, as uh, an invasion of her and the family's privacy. So the controversies really just continue. Uh, in terms of the facts, uh, it's been 25 days now since the mother of two uh, originally disappeared. We know that morning that she, she got up, she loaded the car, took her two children to the local primary school and then went on a walk that she regularly would take with her dog, Willow. We know that she was seen by someone who knows her at the upper field and we know that at 9.33 her phone was located. Now, a body, we don't know yet whether or not it, what, it is Nicola Bully, but a body was found about a mile downstream from where I am today. Uh, it was spotted by two walkers um, who then informed the police and then they sent in their divers. So we could be looking at some answers, but it, it, it's still mm. yet to be known whether or not it is Nicola Bully. Look, Sophie, thank you very, very much. I know that Sophie, who's been all over this case for us pretty much from the start, actually, will be right there on hand as we get any updates. Sophie, thank you. Sophie Reaper there, our GB News North West of England reporter at the scene in Lancashire. But joining me now is the former Detective Chief Inspector at Scotland Yard, and he oversaw a missing persons unit there back in the early 2000s. I'm very pleased to say it's Mike Neville. Mike, thank you. Now, <clears throat> look, people are saying, well, Lancashire Police... Completely vindicated, completely vindicated, because a body, remains to be seen if it's Nicholas, but a body has been found in the river and they were adamant that there would be a body in that river. Have Lancashire police been vindicated? I don't think so, in, in this sense that uh, I've said for, from the very start of this, I referred to the case of the tragic case of the fireman, Anthony Knott, who, who disappeared into the uh, uh, river in, in Sussex in 2020 and, and emerged uh, 21 days later. So uh, this is a very similar sort of timeline to this. Uh, and.
with uh, Peter Foldley, he seems to be making excuses and whatever about the search. But of course, he will always say that he wasn't given the full facts, and he had a he had a, a search team there with all sorts of specialist equipment, and was never told by the Lancashire Police that uh, this lady had all sorts mm. of issues. That may, we, and we speculate about this. She, she may have uh, attempted to take her own life. She may have been pushed and whatever else, but. They did. She, she would. They were never given that those facts when they searched, and it's just awful that the family have been uh, had to wait days and days and days, mm. and she's just one mile away. You know, uh, the, the the Anthony, not the fireman. He was swept uh, eight miles yeah. downstream, and I, I'd like to ask. You know. Did they consult an expert on river movements to say, look, this river's this this wide, this deep, this this temperature, this these well, bends? How far would a body uh, move in this uh, circumstance? Yeah. And I just get the impression that they've been very insular. They didn't like an outside expert coming in. Uh, well, they've yes. not consulted with other experts, and it's a mess. Let me just emphasise, Mike. Obviously, yet to be confirmed, there is a body found in the river. That's the state of play. I get all of that. I'm going to ask the question now that I think most people at home will be thinking. How on earth can you not find a body in a river with all of those resources supposedly less than a mile away from where that person is believed to have gone in the river? I don't understand that. Yeah, well, so what I would say, so a river is a very, very difficult environment, dark and dingy to, to search in. It isn't good enough in the sense it's only a mile away. Uh, one of my teams, I have my expertise as well is uh, super recognizer officers, and they helped to uh, locate the suspect for the Alice Gross murder. And she had been uh, concealed in a river uh, in, in West London. Uh, and uh, they'd already searched the river, the, the frogman, and not been able to find it because it is a very, very difficult environment. Once they've been pinpointed where she may well be, then she was found. But you can, it's almost like a fingertip search because it's so dark down there. It's just a challenging environment. Uh, yeah. And the body sinks. That What you find is the body goes to the bottom. And then what will happen is, of course, it starts to decompose. These are all awful things that people don't want to hear about, I suppose. Oh. But the body decomposes is it fills with gas and then it rises to the top and if you look it's usually between two and three weeks and tragically tragically this is the case it, it, that is the timeline but it just simply isn't good enough i'm with you on that okay now i'm just going to play a little clip stay where you are please mike for me and this is of peter Folding. so peter folding as of the specialist group international which had all of this special equipment the independent dive search team. He's been very vocal. He's been on this show numerous times, actually, in the past couple of weeks. Now, he's copping it a bit this morning. This is a clip of him defending himself earlier on today on our breakfast show. Let's play it. If Nicker had fallen in the play at the bench where the phone was found, she would have landed in two feet of water. She would not have drowned at that location. I don't believe Nicola went in because the police divers searched that area thoroughly that afternoon and drowning victims go to the bottom. She could not have made it over the weir in a day. There's no way. And that my whole team and other police have looked at this. It, it, it baffled me. People are saying that this guy was just caught in publicity, that, you know, he was there for his own self-promotion and all of this. Do you look at Peter Folding and think that actually he's got anything to be accountable for here when it comes to not finding Nicola, or, or is, is he vindicated? <laughs> I, I think he made very unwise statements about her definitely not being in the river. But, of course, as I said to you, he will fall back on the position that he wasn't told the full facts. And if somebody wants to get over that weir, then they will get over that weir. But, obviously, if you think if somebody's just fallen in and they're, and they're drowning, then they won't want to get over the weir. We're mm. then told three weeks later by Lancashire police this lady had all sorts of mental health issues and all sorts of physical things that really mm. we, we didn't need to know about at all. And so it could have been a possibility that she did uh, try to take her own life. We don't know that, and the coroner's no. uh, inquest will no doubt uh, will look into that. But if he given those facts, then he may well have searched further. Uh, and, and I think the, the, the biggest okay. problem for me in all this is the Lancashire Police and the press department and the information that they gave out. At the very start, they tried to portray uh, Nicola as a wholesome yeah. mum, no issues whatsoever. Now, the fact that she had mental health issues, I don't think any of us would have thought any less of her because of that. No. But they, they tried to portray her in one way, which was untrue. Why do that? And then having 
released information, oh, she was a, 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 a domestic incident, which then, of course, her partner is suddenly in the firing line, and then they start to release all this other information, yeah. which we certainly don't need to know. It's, it's one extreme or the other. Absolutely. And I, I do think if Peter Faldling had given more information, mm. we may have had a different result, but it well, was that's very the unwise. In my that's view, the key to say thing. It's, it's, in that river. it's one thing to release duff information and weird information. It's another thing if that information that could have been vital wasn't given to another guy who was trying to help look for Nicola. Mike, thank you. Mike Neville there, former Detective Chief Inspector at Scotland Yard, in their missing person unit, just reacting to the news that there is a body that's been found in the river wire. We are awaiting confirmation as to whether or not that is Nicola. Now, look, I'm going to move on. This is going to be a theme running through the course of the show today because I've been throwing this one over to you, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Should we house... British citizens, basically before we house refugees, numerous councils are currently in the business of either building or acquiring, spending millions doing it, housing for refugees. Councils in England are being given a share of a £500 million pot of cash to acquire houses for Afghan and Ukrainian refugees. It's part of an effort to ensure that those who fled from war have a safe place to live, as the government are being warned, though, that increasing numbers of Ukrainians are facing homelessness and destitution. But this has sparked concern, I would argue it sparked outrage, actually, about who gets what in terms of housing and how much there is to go around. Should we be spending this money on people who are already here, have been here their whole lives and, frankly, need a place to live? Giselle says the UK has no regard for British citizens. Keep your emails coming in on this. But here to, to cut through the noise on this and give us more detail, it's GB News' economics and business editor and actually housing guru as well. It's Liam Halligan with On The Money. Liam, some people are saying... Did you call me a housing gnu? Guru. <laughs> a guru yeah. people, are saying, people are saying that we should be prioritising housing for Brits. We haven't got enough to go around as it is. Hit me. So, I think the political party that solves the issue, not just of housing, but in particular social housing, would win the next election and then sub subsequent elections and, quite frankly, would deserve to. Back in 1979, a third of people in this country lived in social housing, housing owned by the state. It's now 13%. It's much less. I personally think we need a lot more social housing, Patrick. We mm. spend 35 billion quid a year, the government does, on housing benefit. That's housing people who are vulnerable and, frankly, don't earn enough in their jobs. They're not all unemployed by any means. You know, if you've got a low-income job, a low-skilled job, with all respect, mm. you obviously often can't afford the market rent or to be able to buy a home. Yeah. So we need more social housing, in my view. I think it should be about 20% of the population. But as it happens, we're building very, very few council houses. In fact, we're demolishing more than we're building. Last year, we built 7,000 across the whole of the UK and we demolished 29,000. In me. fact, on average, since <laughs> 1991, we've taken 24,000 off the stock of social housing. And that's not all right to buy. Some of it's right to buy. In some parts of the UK, by the way, right to buy has been suspended, but we can talk about that yep. another time, Wales in particular. Yeah. We've had a net loss of 24,000 a year in terms of social housing on average since 1991. And that's why you've got this million plus waiting list. That's why you've got so much overcrowding. You know, talk to the excellent charity Shelter. Yeah. They will give you chapter and verse on the number of families in bed and breakfast accommodation, in temporary accommodation, the number of what we call, Patrick, in this country, concealed households. That's where you've got. Not, say, a, 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 a mum living with a daughter mm. who's got a kid. That's not a concealed household. A concealed household is when you have two completely different families who aren't related mm. living in the same house. And we have millions of those in the UK simply because we've built too few homes. Right. And that's why, when you have Basildon in yeah. Essex looking to spend two and a half million quid on council houses they want for 17, refugees, 17 they want to buy 17 houses. When you have the council in Boston, in Lincolnshire, buying up homes too, when you have the council in North Hants yet to decide but contemplating spending £3.5, mm. million pounds, particularly on social housing for Ukrainian and Afghan refugees. I do understand why ordinary working-class Brits who've been here for generations... This isn't jingoism, it's just common it's sense. It's true. ..get really upset about that. Now, if you look at it in the round, 
historically, and I've written a lot about this, it isn't actually the case that there's an awful lot of discrimination against white indigenous people in council houses. There is a little bit at the margins, and obviously where it happens, people get really angry Take about off, it. Yeah. But in this particular case, when there is such a housing shortage and there has been such a high profile influx of refugees, it seems odd if you are going to have a, have a council house building drive to at not least do one for one, to say, yeah. yes, we're going to do a load of council housing and say a third or a half of them we're going to put to one side, particularly for refugees who have genuinely yes. fled war. I think ordinary British people are tolerant enough to put up with that, but to have a programme that seems to be, as, as far as these reports are concerned, geared entirely towards refugees is likely to cause a great deal of political turmoil. Yeah, indeed. And I think with, with you know, quite good justification, people are emailing in in their droves here. I'll go to those shortly. So, Basildon, they're looking to build 17 new homes. You might rightly mentioned there's some of the other places. I've also got Birmingham here. They're yeah. looking to buy somewhere in the region of 50. Now, when it comes to buying, OK, they presumably will be buying someone's... In fact, in the case of North North Northamptonshire, they're looking to buy houses that were formerly right to buy. So these places will presumably be buying houses at the lower end of the housing market. So let's say someone is on 30, 40 grand a year, something along those That's lines. That's well over the average, right? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Looking to get, to get onto the property ladder in their area where yeah. their job is, now that housing market is going to be squeezed even more. It will be squeezed even more, that's right. It all comes down to, Patrick, the fact that we are simply not building enough homes. And why have we stopped building council houses? Why did we start in the 60s building council houses in massive tower blocks? Yeah. Where I grew up on the outskirts of London, most of my mates lived in council houses, but those council houses were low density, low rise, with a fair amount of green space. They were decent homes. I spent a lot of my childhood in, in, in them. Um, but now we're building council houses, often in inner city situations that are tower blocks, because land has become so expensive, mm. and that's to do with the way land is taxed. It's a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. But the problem that councils have is just to buy the land to you build the council houses is really, really expensive. That's why I've been campaigning for years for the Treasury, and it does tend to be the Treasury again, mm. to release government-owned land. The government owns about 7% of all land in this country. I'm not talking about national parks or the Queen's estate or anything like that, separate from that. I'm, and I'm not saying that we should build houses in the middle of Salisbury Plain, which yeah, is owned, yeah. owned by the MOD. Yeah. The, the government owns many, many inner city sites that are ripe for social housing that could be built on if only the Treasury would release them for local authorities to use them to build affordable social housing mm -hmm. that people can buy and also council housing that people can rent from the state at subsidised rents, particularly when they have low-income jobs. Liam, thank you. That's great. Fantastic stuff. Liam Halligan there, our economics and business editor and... Housing guru. Gnu. 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 There we go. <laughs> right, look, thank you very much, Tim. Now, look, responding to more housing support for Ukrainian refugees, this is the chairman now of the Local Government Association. It's Councillor James Jamieson, so good they named him twice. Uh, the LGA has been raising concerns with governments on the growing number of Ukrainians presenting as homeless to councils, and in particular, the significant rise in those who arrived through the Homes for Ukraine scheme. We are pleased that the government has been working with the LGA and councils on funding to help families move into their own homes, reduce homelessness risks and help local partners acquire more housing. The flexibility to open these up to more general use in the long term will also assist with other housing challenges across local communities. Now, look, I think that many of you will be looking at this story now and the figures on this are pretty stark and thinking, well, if people are genuine refugees, and in the case of Ukrainians and I think in the case of uh, many uh, Afghans as well, that is different to people that we're seeing coming over across the channel in small boats and a lot of those people who are now in hotels, quite probably in your local community, and bed and breakfast, etc. But the big question for me on this is, if there is money in the pot to build new homes for people who presumably are unemployed or certainly towards the lower end of the employment scheme and are new to this country, 
then why aren't there homes for people who are some of the one million, for example, on the waiting list? And just quickly before I go to these emails, I'm going to give you some facts again. Two million quid in Basildon is going to be spent for 17 new homes for refugees from Afghanistan and Ukraine. Boston Borough Council, they're going to buy eight homes, supposedly. Birmingham, an initial 30 homes could be bought, with 20 later added on. North Northamptonshire, they plan to buy 30 homes. Now, some of these people are going to use homes either that were in the right-to-buy scheme or, get this, they're going to run out surplus council stock. I'll emphasise again, here we go. One million people already here on a waiting list. What's going on? Is that right? Should we house Brits first? GB Views at gbnews.uk. Loads of you getting in touch, no surprise. Steve says, there's plenty of houses to go around, especially in rural areas. I see boarded up properties all the time. Make a law to let councils take over any houses that have been empty for six months to renovate and rent out. Yes, uh, uh, OK, Steve, I mean, in a way, just to taking that at face value, fine. But who would you house there first? That's really the question I'm trying to get at. Pat says, good name. Of course we should put our own folk first. Some of our folk I know have been on housing lists for years. If this happens, there will be riots as people are fed up with the whole thing. It's a bad look, in my opinion, at the same time as us unequivocally being a welcoming country. I mean, people opened up their own homes. For Ukrainian refugees, didn't they? They opened up their own homes, people still have them living there. Now, it was supposed to be temporary, clearly the war is rumbling on, and I don't think anyone in their right minds would think, we'll just wave goodbye to a load of Ukrainian refugees and send them packing back to Kiev or whatever. I don't think anyone thinks that. But the question for me here is priorities. Why have we not been building homes or letting out surplus council stock to homeless military veterans, to hard-up single mums? What about buying as well? Buying. Cheap housing stock, the kind of housing stock that first-time buyers, young first-time buyers on a low wage would have been saving up for years to try to scrape a deposit together for and then wallop. In comes your local council and goes, I'll have that. You never know, they might even pay a bit over the asking price. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? And then they own that and people in that, well, you'll probably end up paying twice, won't you, as well, because they won't be paying the rent themselves, will they? GB Views at gbnews.uk. We'll be returning to this throughout the course of the show. Do you think we should house Brits first? But coming up, the classic books by children's author Roald Dahl is having a modern day makeover with certain words removed to prevent effect. Oh, the snowflakes have got hold of Dahl, people. The world's gone mad. No, can't say that anyway. Is it the right thing to do or is censorship by the politically correct brigade absolutely bonkers? You cannot call Augustus Gloop Fat. He's now enormous. He's, I'd rather be called fat than enormous. Anyway, either way, he's a fatty, fatty bum bum. Back in a moment. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. 
I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, <laughs> right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good afternoon from the GB News. I'm Tamsin Roberts. It's 3.33. Here are the headlines. President Biden has promised more than $500 million worth of aid to Ukraine after making a surprise trip to its capital. It comes just days before the first anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Mr Zelensky said the visit was an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians. The US president said his country would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Putin thought Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. As you know, Mr. President, I said to you in the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. He thought he could outlast us. I don't think he's thinking that right now. God knows what he's thinking, but I don't think he's thinking that. The partner of missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, has spoken of the family's agony after a body was found yesterday in the river near to where she went missing. Lancashire police are working to provide a formal identification of the body, which was found in the water around a mile from where Nicola was last seen. They're currently treating the death as unexplained. The 45-year-old disappeared more than three weeks ago whilst walking her dog. More than 11,000 healthcare workers from the GMB and Unite unions in England and Wales are walking out today in their continuing dispute over pay and staffing. The workers striking include ambulance workers, paramedics and call handlers. GMB says it's over a month since the government engaged in meaningful dialogue. Elsewhere, the result of a ballot of around 45,000 junior doctors is expected to be announced later today by the British Medical Association. We can just bring you some breaking news. In the last few minutes, an inquest has concluded that five people who were shot and killed near Plymouth in 2021 were unlawfully killed. 22-year-old Jake Davison shot and killed his mother, along with four other people in Keyham in August 2021, before turning the gun on himself. The inquest heard how Davison legally held a shotgun certificate and had an obsession with firearms. That news just in in the last few minutes. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now, back to Patrick. Yes, Tamsin, thank you very, very much. Right, let's talk about Roald Dahl. And Rishi Sunak has criticised the decision to make numerous changes to the children's author's novels. Dahl is being censored, OK? It's absolutely bonkers. So words like fat and ugly have been removed. Oh, it sounds like my Tinder profile. Huh? Roald Dahl's story company say that they wanted to make the books more suitable for modern audiences. So the Prime Minister's spokesman said... When it comes to our rich and varied literary heritage, the Prime Minister agrees with the BFG, who was the big friendly giant, that we shouldn't gobble funk around with words. And I must say, it's very easy to mispronounce that word, and I'm glad I didn't at this particular time of the day. Look, so Mrs Twit from the Twit is, is no longer ugly and beastly. Let's go through some of these changes, OK, that have been made to the book. So we've got the first edition of The Witches, 
says, don't be foolish, my grandmother says. You can't go round pulling the hair of every lady you meet, even if she is wearing gloves. Just you try it and see what happens. So now it says, don't be foolish, my grandmother says. Besides, there are plenty of other reasons why women might wear wigs, and there is certainly nothing wrong with that. Oh, well, there we go. OK, the, the bald female community will be happy about that. Also from the witches is the line, even if she's working as a cashier in the supermarket or typing letters for a businessman, and that has become, even if she's working as a top scientist or running a business. Right, so we've now upscaled. We've given the women in the witches uh, other reasons for wearing a wig and a promotion, a massive promotion. And from the original Matilda... She went on olden day sailing ships with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rudyard Kipling. I've got a feeling I know what's coming in here. She went to, now it says, she went to 19th century estates with Jane Austen. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway. Oh, yes, there we go. And of course, she went to California with John Steinbeck. Good grief. Well, until, you know, obviously the modern culture catches up with any of those and then we'll have to remove all of that. The top one for me, by the way, is, is this, OK? Augustus Gloop from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, the one who's all hovering things into his face, like massive fatty, right, is now described as enormous, OK, because the word fat has been removed from every book, right? Well, we've all got eyes... And frankly, even those of us who don't, I think, can have a pretty good idea just by what he's eating that Augustus Gloop is indeed a trundling lardmeister. But to discuss this, I'm joined now by the academic and author, Dr Heather Brunskill-Evans. Thank you very much. Um, would you be offended if, in a children's book, someone was described as either fat or ugly? Why are we censoring this stuff for modern audiences? Uh, well... I wouldn't be offended, but I am offended by something. And I'll tell you what I'm offended by. I'm offended by the ways in which campaigners and political activists are managing to get control of almost every aspect of our existence, including now children's books. So this is a, it's a really serious issue and it goes beyond changes to Roald Dahl's books, which quite honestly, Patrick, as you were reading that out, I wanted to, I actually wanted to burst into laughter. It's yeah. it's risable. But but I think the audience needs to sort of, as I'm sure the GB audience will realise, this is much bigger than any changes to children's literature. It's what's going on behind in all our institutions in relation to diversity and inclusion, which ironically ends up excluding people. So, um, mm. yeah. Talk to me a bit more about that, because it's all very well and good for me to sit here, as I intend to continue yeah. doing, by the way, taking the mickey out of what I would regard yeah. as these idiotic changes and all of this stuff. Yeah, but yeah. there is, as you've rightly identified, Heather, a much more serious undertone to this, which yeah. is that the woke brigade have got hold of, well, everything, haven't they? Everything. Everything. Absolutely everything. Um, I understand that the Roald Dahl estate went to a particular org a consultancy um, in order to change the language. The consultancy has, you know, talks about diversity, inclusion, all children need to be represented in literature. And all of these things sound absolutely fantastic. I mean, who is against diversity oh. and inclusion? No one is against that. But in practical reality, as it turns out, these ideological projects end up excluding people. Can I just bring in something that um, in my research today for this, I was I discovered that Netflix, which has bought some of the uh, rights to the books, um, the estate has said that from the millions of pounds that they will get to Netflix from Netflix, what they will do is they will contribute to children's charities that are concerned with children's health, mm. anti-racism and so on. And I immediately thought, well, actually, if we really had our eye on the ball about protecting children from harmful stereotypes, we should have been watching what was happening to this Tavistock absolutely years yeah. ago. And what has happened at the Tavistock, the Tavistock has been informed by the very children's charities that may be being paid money from well, the Royal Dahl estate. So and, we need to join was, up the dots. That was 
case, according to some people, which, of course, Tavistock vehemently deny, but that was a case, yeah. according to some, of ideology taking over medical practice. And that, I think, yeah. a lot of people would argue is incredibly dangerous, especially when it involves yeah. children. But just veering yeah. us back onto this now, from what... I was talking to a friend of mine who's actually a publisher the other day, and they were saying, if you want to get a kid's book published these days, right, it's got to have, like, a trans character in it, it's got to have some kind of LGB yeah. reference in it, it's got to have a load of ethnic diversity in it, it's got to have, yeah. like, a female lead or, or something like this. And I actually must say, there was a chap I saw on Instagram who was a friend of a friend, and I happen to know that he wasn't necessarily always the nicest individual when he was younger, actually. Um, who was uh, there tweeting, oh, he's just had a baby and he's, he's reading them uh, uh, gender-reversed... A new baby that can't really hear or see anything at this stage, a newborn baby. <laughs> he's reading them yeah. uh, gender-reversed children's books. And, and I actually... It does seriously, genuinely, I'm, and I'm not exaggerating now, Heather, makes me wonder whether or not I want to bring a child into this world. Yeah. Yeah, so, in fact, absolutely, publishing now is becoming very restrictive. You're only allowed to publish certain things in children's books and not other things. So it's really quite authoritarian. In the name of progressivism, it's it's authoritarian. I wasn't actually, just to say, Patrick, I wasn't mm. trying to divert to the Tavistock. What I was trying to explain is that mm. the political activism underlying mm. protection for children, diversity for children, inclusion for children, in a strange way, ends up acting in reverse. And it's that mm. that we need to to, to really focus on. I mean, ah, oh, with regard to the books, I mean, yep. what they're actually, if I can just say this before, before you move on, it's actually making the books less rich, less appealing to children. So if we want to talk about diversity, to pull in children who maybe are not enjoying books, Roald Dahl yeah. has been very effective because it makes children laugh. It may be sort of, you know, we don't want to make fun of fat people, but the reality is that children do find Roald Dahl books mm. very, very appealing. And if we sanitise them, we'll mm. lose a whole cohort I agree. of kids. It's, part of, it's, also, it's also fiction. It could not be more fictional, yes, right? It's exactly. set in different worlds and different things. And it's so what if one of the characters is, is, is fat? It's a, it's a visual way of doing it. And they're, 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 they're a caricature of themselves stuffing chocolate into his face. It's not taking Absolutely. the mickey out of people who are carrying a few pounds. I mean, look at me, for goodness sake. I'm not exactly stick thin. I'm yeah. not a long-distance runner. But, yeah. you know, at the same time, this is just getting ridiculous. Look, Heather, thank you. I could talk to you all day. Yeah. But I'm not allowed to. <laughs> Uh, Heather Brunskill Evans there, who is, of course, uh, an academic and an author, just reacting to this news that Roald Dahl's essentially been got at by the Work Brigade. Now, don't go anywhere, because we've got lots coming your way. Next, no, it's not Groundhog Day. It's, it's, it's a dispute that never ends, these people. Today, thousands of ambulance workers, they're staging fresh walkouts, long-running dispute over pay and staffing. I've got a little bit of info for you, which maybe would give you a slightly different take on how justified these strikes are. And later on in the show, I'm going to attempt the impossible. I'm going to attempt the impossible. I am going to try to find Prince Andrew a job. I'll see you in two. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you oh, are. Well, you, that's you, my you, you, no. My political ambitions are <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Okay, all to play for for the next 15 minutes or so of this hour, ladies and gentlemen. Now, yes, Groundhog Day, OK, but some interesting new info has just come out. We're turning to the latest strike action. Thousands of ambulance workers, they're staging fresh strikes today in a long-running dispute over pay, working conditions. Now, the GMB union say that over 11,000 of his ambulance workers are walking out across England and Wales. There's paramedics, emergency care assistants, call handlers... There's a lot of info flying around at the minute about what pay they have been offered. They're saying, I think, in many cases, there's been no negotiation. There has been a bit of negotiation. We'll talk about that in a second. But we can go live now to GB News' national reporter, Ellie Costello. And Ellie's on a picket line in Crawley for us. Ellie, what's the mood like? Good afternoon to you, Patrick. Well, I must say that the morale here is quite high. You might be able to see behind me, they're actually cooking sausages on this barbecue here. Lots of tooting of horns. There does seem to be a lot of public support here. There's even a dog on the, the picket line here, which they're calling a pup, pup epidemic. Is that right? Papa Medic, sorry, Papa Medic on the GMB picket line here. Now, we've been told that about 25% of the South East Coast Ambulance Headquarters here, about 25% of staff are going to be on the picket line today. And that is because 75% have to stay in the building in order to continue to answer emergency calls. And that is a really important thing to say. The NHS says if you are in need of an emergency ambulance today, do ring 999 and your answer that your call will be answered today. But I want to bring in Lib Whitfield now, uh, who is the regional GMB uh, officer for South East England. So, Lib, why are we on the picket line today? Why are people feeling so passionate about this? This is day four of strike action, and this is because the government still hasn't come to the table to talk pay with our members. They had a 4% pay award last year, which, again, with inflation above 10%, is another pay cut and they simply cannot afford to keep being underpaid. I mean, the biggest criticism of all NHS strikes is that this is selfish, that this will disrupt on patients and for people who are so desperately in need of an ambulance, they're going to be disrupted, aren't they? There could be delays. So the government likes to tell the, the line that this is selfish for people to actually want better pay. But actually underneath that is the fact that we have thousands of vacancies across the NHS and even 3,000 vacancies across the ambulance service because we cannot recruit and retain staff because they're being paid far less than they need to be and they've had a 20% real cut pay in their pay over the last 12 years. It simply cannot continue. And for the public who are wanting services today, you can see that some of my members are here, but there are 75% of them in that building ready to respond. My members here are in uniform so they can respond from the picket lines as well should anything happen. And the last three strikes have shown an improvement in service. So tell us about the conditions then that, that some of your workers, some of your members are seeing on shift that's led them to come to the picket line today. My members are seeing actual harming coming to patients day in, day out. I mean, we've got a sign over there saying that, you know, they're not patients aren't dying because they're striking. But they're striking because patients are dying and that is what's happening. All the evidence shows that patients are coming to harm because of delays in ambulance and the lack of staff in the NHS. And this government is ignoring that critical situation. Day four of strike action, Lib, are you getting anywhere? Well, the government seem to be absolutely adamant that they're going to ignore us. It's going to continue to be very difficult to do so. More and more unions are striking alongside the NHS, and in fact, more and more of the unions have ballots across the ambulance service. There is now no longer a single ambulance service in the country that does not have a mandate to strike. And my members are absolutely clear. They are here until the government listen. 
Okay, Lib Whitfield, regional organiser of GMB, really good to speak to you this afternoon. Well, Patrick, let's get a word uh, from the government. Steve Barkley, the House Secretary, says the strikes are in nobody's interest. He says that constructive talks have been held with the GMB union, who say that 11,000 of its members are out on strike today. He says that none of these unions should be going out on strike. He's urged them to call it off. Of course, that is not the case. 11,000 are on strike today here, 25% of its members are here on strike today. But, Patrick, we could see more upheaval in the NHS in the next few weeks and months. We're going to hear the results of the junior doctor ballot a little bit later on today. 45,000 members have voted on that strike action. We'll find out whether they voted in favour of it or not a little bit later on. But we could see weeks and months of disruption, strike action to come, and yet still no sign of a resolution. Ali, I'm sorry about this. Can I just ask you, just quickly, sorry, we hadn't planned this, but can I just ask you to um, get that the lady you were talking to there, just to, to qualify something? I did think she said, I might have misheard, I thought she said that the last three strikes had shown an improvement in the ambulance service. Would, would it be possible to just get her to say what she means about that? Is that OK? Sorry, I think uh, yeah, might just be sure. worth knowing what she said there. Patrick Christie, our presenter, has just asked about the, I think you said, the, the previous three days of strike action. You actually saw an improvement uh, in ambulance requests and an, an ambulance service in that time. Can you explain a little bit more about that? And is that actually the case? Yeah, you can actually look up the statistics for yourselves. All of the trusts have issued the statistics on it. So there was actually improvement in service across all of the ambulance trusts in the country. And in fact, the ambulance trust chief execs have written to the health select committee and said that the derogations we have in place have been outstanding across the country. So for the government to then try and say that we're putting people's lives at danger when they're the ones not meeting targets day to day and putting people's lives at risk is simply unacceptable. And it's what we were talking about just before we came on air, isn't it? Is the idea that we that you have put all of these provisions in place? There are still 75% of staff within that building to answer yeah. emergency calls, uh, so that on strike days, hopefully, patients are not affected. But Lib, thank you so yeah, much no, for fine. clarifying that for us. There you go, Patrick. Back to thank you, Ali. Thank you. Sorry about that. Cheers, Ali. Ali Costello, there. Fantastic stuff, there. Ali Costello, our national reporter. Well, look, can I just my initial observations on this then? If the last three days of strike actions have it resulted in improved service. That is because the people who are on the coalface, those striking, have implemented their own systems to dealing with call-outs. And I've said this time and time again, I think that the people that they should be striking against is not necessarily the government and not about pay, it's about their management and the way that they are managed. Because clearly, if you can go on strike and organise a strike rotor and that works more efficiently than the rotor that the people who are paid good money in the NHS to sort out, if that's better than what they're doing, then the people you should be striking against, I think, are your managers. But there we go. That's just my two pennies worth. Anyway, my inbox is full today. We've discussed the decision for councils across England to spend millions of pounds to build houses for refugees from Afghanistan and from Ukraine. And I'm going to go to that inbox right now. So if you aren't just joining us, this is a big one. We're going to be talking about it throughout the show. So two million quid is set to be used to build 17 new homes for refugees from Afghanistan and Ukraine. That's in Basildon alone. Boston Borough Council, they're looking at buying eight homes. We've also got Birmingham, they're looking at buying an initial 30 homes, 20 more to be, to be added, 50 in total. North Northamptonshire, they're planning on buying 30 homes. Now, what's interesting is a lot of these homes uh, are going to be, they're also going to use, by the way, £3.7 million of its own cash in North Northamptonshire to match a government grant over the coming year. So not all of this is coming out of the government part. So if you are in North Northamptonshire at the minute and you are one of the one million people across England and the UK who are on a housing waiting list or you are one of the millions more who are currently in temporary accommodation, maybe you're sofa surfing, if you're a homeless military veteran, for example, how do you feel about the fact that the government and local councils are spending millions of pounds either buying or building new homes for refugees? Now, I know that people say, well, these people are genuine refugees. They are not the same as every single person that we're seeing coming across the channels. So these are Ukrainians and people from, from Afghanistan. So they've been cleared through the system. They are now classed as genuine refugees. So, OK, they need somewhere to live. But it does open the question, doesn't it? Should we be housing Brits first? And that's what I've been asking you, GBviews at GBnews.uk. Now, there's no name on this one, but they say this country must be the laughingstock of the world 
It says, we don't take care of our own and our older folk are left at the bottom of the pile. They go on to say the government and council should hold their heads in shame. I've got a few more on this, more than a few. In fact, it has kicked right off, frankly. People are saying, why on earth are we doing this? We should house our own people first. Disgraceful, my son is homeless and the council will not house him. He works full time. He's trying to work whilst living on the streets and sofa surfing. They name a council who's not here to defend themselves, so I won't go on to name that particular council, but you get the drift. And frankly, it's basically all this in the inbox, actually. I just want your views on it. There's been a massive reduction in social housing. We've basically stopped building... Well, not stopped building it. We're not building enough social housing. We are also selling off some of that. And then the other side of it is not just about housing people who are homeless. It's also the lower end of the housing market being bought up. So if you have a son or daughter, or maybe yourself, and you're on the, the low tens of thousands of pounds every single year, you've been scrimping and saving to get yourself a deposit and get on the housing ladder. Well, now, wallop, your local council comes in and buys it and plonks a refugee in there. How do you feel? GB Views and GBNews.UK coming up. We'll have the very latest developments after a body was found in the search for missing Nicola Bully and the cenotaph, Sir Winston Churchill. Find out exactly who else's statues are massively under threat. Our culture is under threat, ladies and gentlemen. GB Views at GBNews.UK. Back in a tick. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European <laughs> Parliament. But here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GV News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Well, it's four o'clock and you're with GB News and me, Patrick Christie. So, this hour, brand new homes for refugees. Councils are spending millions of pounds buying or building properties for those fleeing conflict. But what about British people already on the housing waiting list? I am asking throughout the course of this show, should we house Brits first? GB Views at GBNews.UK. In other news, a body has been found in the river. Now, if it is Nicola Bully, have Lancashire police been completely vindicated or are you still raging at the cock-ups that they've made? How could so many people not find a body? Should some of our statues and memorials be removed to protect them from harm? Yes, you heard me, a preemptive strike on our culture, ladies and gents. Well, Scotland Yard, get this, has a dossier of certain central London landmarks which are considered potential targets for campaigners like the Black Lives Matter group. OK, so they're supposedly under threat, under threat from the Black Lives Matter group. Memorials commemorating the war dead, Sir Winston Churchill, they're apparently included on a secret police list. Well, it's not that secret anymore, is it? We've got hold of it. Is our history in danger of being erased? And everyone's favourite. London Mayor Sadiq Khan is to spend 130 million quid on giving thousands of primary school pupils 
free school meals, saving parents £440 a year. Now, he says it will give low-income families a lifeline. Well, actually, is this right? He also said it was an emergency. Is it right? Could the money be better spent elsewhere? Is he trying to say sorry for the big environmental charges he's hammering us all with? I want to know, because bear in mind this is probably going to come to a town or a city near you. It's not just about London, this, people, even if it sounds like it. I just think, rich parents, what about this? Rich parents are still going to get subsidies. And if we're being honest, how expensive is a school lunch, OK? And actually, should parents be able to pay for it? GBviews at gbnews.uk. The big one I'm asking you, though, is should refugees essentially skip a housing waiting list? GBviews at gbnews.uk. But right now, it's your latest headlines with the wonderful Polly McLeod. Patrick, thank you and good afternoon to you. Our top story today on GB News. President Biden has promised more than $500 million worth of aid to Ukraine after making a surprise trip to its capital. It comes just days before the first anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Mr Zelensky said the visit was an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians. The US president said his country would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Putin thought Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. As you know, Mr. President, I said to you in the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. He thought he could outlast us. I don't think he's thinking that right now. God knows what he's thinking, but I don't think he's thinking that. Here at home, the partner of missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, has spoken of the family's agony after a body was found yesterday in the River Wire near to where she went missing. Lancashire Police are working to provide a formal identification of the body, which was found in the water around a mile from where Nicola was last seen. They're currently treating the death as unexplained. The 45-year-old disappeared more than three weeks ago whilst walking her dog. An inquest has concluded that five people who were shot and killed near Plymouth in 2021 were unlawfully killed. 22-year-old Jake Davison killed his own mother, along with four other people, including a child, before turning the gun on himself. The inquest heard how Davison legally held a shotgun certificate and had an obsession with firearms. More than 11,000 healthcare workers from the GMB and Unite Unions in England and Wales are walking out today in their continuing dispute over pay and staffing. The workers striking include ambulance workers, paramedics and call handlers. GMB says it's over a month since the government engaged in what it's calling meaningful dialogue. Elsewhere, the result of a ballot of around 45,000 junior doctors is expected to be announced later today by the British Medical Association. The Foreign and Northern Ireland secretaries are to speak with the European Commission Vice President later today as negotiations continue over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Number 10 has denied reports the Prime Minister has been forced to delay announcing a breakthrough amid a backlash from his own MPs. The DUP and backbench Tories say it won't support a deal which retains oversight from the European Court of Justice. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says there's a real window of opportunity now to move forward. The UK and the EU have obviously edged closer together. The question now is whether the Prime Minister is strong enough to get it through his own backbenchers. Um, and what I've said is, um, on Northern Ireland, the national interest comes first. So we will put party politics to one side. We will vote with the government if there's a deal to vote for. And so the Prime Minister doesn't have to rely on his backbenchers. Um, you know, we in the Labour Party are putting country first and party second. Now, the most dangerous domestic abusers will be added to the sex offender register as the Home Office vows to treat violence against women as a national threat. The government plans to invest up to £8.4 million over the next two years to fund specialist support programmes for victims. Domestic abuse affected around 2.5 million people in England and Wales in the last year. The Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, says changes are needed. I'm changing the law to ensure that there's more robust monitoring 
of perpetrators. We're introducing measures to ensure that we will be able to tag uh, offenders of domestic abuse. Uh, and we will be also adding uh, offenders of domestic abuse onto the violent and sex offenders register. Uh, and also, all police chiefs uh, and forces around the country will now be put on a footing to deal with violence against women and girls as a national threat. In Scotland, the Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, has announced her bid to become the new leader of the SNP and First Minister. That's after Nicola Sturgeon's unexpected resignation last week. Former SNP Westminster leader Angus Robertson has ruled himself out of the leadership race, saying it's not the right time for him or his family. And Scotland's Health Secretary, Humza Yousaf, has already confirmed he will run, as will former Community Safety Minister Ash Regan. The new SNP leader will be announced on the 27th of March. That's all from me. I'm back in half an hour. See you then. OK, ladies and gents, I'm going to go to Lancashire very shortly and talk about the Nicola Bully case, a body found in the river yet to be confirmed to be Nicola's. But before that, uh, you've kicked right off. You've kicked right off in my inbox, gbviews at gbnews.uk. This is a story I'll be doing just in a few minutes' time about the fact that councils, possibly all councils, are spending millions of pounds, some of their own money, some government money, on either building new homes or buying homes for refugees. And these are people who've come from Ukraine or Afghanistan. And a lot of you are saying that basically, in answer to my question, should we be using money and housing stock to house Brits? First, a lot of you have answered yes to that. Bit of context, one million people currently, according to Liam Halligan anyway, our economics and business editor and housing guru, one million people already on a housing waiting list in this country. It looks like, doesn't it, it looks as though refugees will be skipping the queue on a housing waiting list. Uh, just time for one email here, but I'm, I'm going to talk about this a lot. Uh, hi, Patrick. I, I, is it time that we ask ourselves whether or not we're a bit overcrowded now? As Sharon says, and th I'm sorry to hear this, Sharon, but Sharon says, I cry for my country, with a little crying emoji there. We're going to return to this later on, but do you think that we should be housing Brits first? Or, of course, is it completely justified? Where else do we house these people? It's a big debate. But moving on from that now, OK, a bit of a gear change, this, because we start with the latest from Lancashire. And the partner of the missing mum, Nicola Bully, has described his agony after a body was found in the River Wire in Lancashire, close to where Nicola went missing. The body, which has not yet been identified, was discovered on Sunday morning and has prompted fresh questions about the effectiveness and competence of the police operation. Well, this morning, the Home Secretary said she had some serious concerns about the release of some personal information of Nicola Bully. Let's have it. I did have concerns earlier in the week about uh, some of the elements rela relating to the release of personal information uh, of Nicola Bully into the public domain. I raised those concerns with the Chief Constable. I wasn't wholly satisfied, I have to say, with some of the responses I got, but it is a matter for the police themselves. There are some investigations ongoing, looking into uh, how the investigation has been handled, and we must let that uh, carry out uh, its own process. OK, well, that was, of course, Swella Bradman there, our Home Secretary. This case has been mysterious. It's gripped the nation. It's been just seeded with controversy, hasn't it, from start to finish. But before we get stuck into whether or not the police have been vindicated, whether the handling of this has been OK, whether or not there's bigger issues here with the police, what about that independent diver as well, Peter Folding? He was all over the media. He was on this show basically saying she's not in the river. Well... It turns out there has been a body found in the river. With us now for the latest and the facts on this is GB News' northwest of England reporter, it's Sophie Reaper. Sophie, thank you very much. Yes, OK, so no identification formally taken place yet of this body that has been found in the river. None just yet. We are still waiting for an update from Lancashire Police. Of course, it was yesterday that the body was recovered from the River Wire after major police presence in St Michael's on Wire. Uh, two walkers spotted something in the river and then... Uh, got the police involved. Police divers went in and pulled a body from it. Uh, as you say, we're yet to know exactly um, whether or not that body is the body of Nicola Bully. We're still waiting for confirmation and formal identification is still underway. Um, of course, 
we don't know yet, but hope does seem to be waning. The family of Nicola Bully say they're bracing for the worst. Uh, we're going to be bringing you an update on, on that as soon as we can, but you mentioned the facts. Mm. We know that Nicola Bully got up on Friday the 27th of January, took her two children to school, went on a walk that was a, a, a really regular walk for her. Uh, she followed the path round to the upper field and to the bench where her phone uh, was located, and that's really as much as we know. We, we do know that a body has been pulled from the river about a mile downstream from here. We don't know whether or not that's Nicola Bully yet, but we will be bringing you updates on that either way as soon as we know. Sophie, thank you. Yet again, Sophie Reaper there, GB News' northwest of England reporter. Well, look, as I was talking about, the force in Lancashire has faced some criticism, to say the least, over its decision to release personal information relating to Nicola. There's a lot of controversy around this case. Important to say... That body has not yet formally been identified as Nicola, but a body found around a mile away from where Nicola is believed to have gone in. So a mile away also from where they found a phone on the bench, the dog off its harness. We all know those particular details of that case by now, don't we? I, I, to be honest with you, I find it absolutely staggering that an independent dive team and also the full might of Lancashire Police's force and outside resources, etc., were unable to detect a body in a river. That's just my take on it. I don't understand how that has taken over three weeks for a dog walker to find this particular body. So criticisms initially just about the capabilities of Lancashire Police, but then also in terms of their communication. OK, let's get the thoughts now of barrister and legal commentator Francis Hoare. Thank you very, very much, Francis. This is an incredibly, incredibly complicated and controversial case. Do you think that Lancashire Police have now been vindicated by the fact that a body has been found in the river? I have no idea because nor, nor does anyone. Um, mm. The whole point about this is we don't know why police have made these decisions. Um, mm. we, we don't know, I, I'm not entirely clear how many resources, how much resources have been devoted to this case, but I assume it's substantial. Um, I don't know why a, a diver, independent diver, was um, able to get onto the scene and make those remarks to the, um, to the press. Um, I, I, I don't think I, I think I'm right in saying he was an independent diver and not mm. employed by the police. Um, is that right? Um, I yes. Think you know that, yeah. To be to that. It, it, exactly. Um, and, but, but... And, and in addition to that, I don't know why um, it, her body was. If 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 this body tragically mm. was a Nicola Bullies, I I don't know why it was found a, a, a mile away, and nor does anyone. Mm. Uh, and and that's the point. There's been fevered speculation with very little evidence, and there's very little reason to make any conclusion whatsoever, positive or negative, against the police. And so how do you feel about the initial police's communications? Because people were saying initially, well, you're not giving us enough detail. And it's a very fine line with the press, because you've got to give people like me, frankly, a bit of info, OK? But then... If you withhold too much, which I think initially is what the police have been accused of doing, then that actually, perversely, fuels speculation and leads to things. And then they ended up releasing very personal, very intimate details about Nicola later on. So about problems with alcohol, for example, um, the, the menopause as well, and uh, hormonal issues, which I feel quite bad saying, really, but it's what, it's what they've said, right? So that kind of stuff. And then that then really changes the complexion of the way that people view it. Well, what do you make, really, for, I suppose, from, from, from the way that the police have communicated this? Again, I simply don't know. I don't know why they released um, those, that information at a late stage. I, I don't know whether there was a reason for it. There might have been, perhaps. Perhaps they decided to release that information because they thought that she might still be at large or she thought they thought that somebody might have information which might be spurred by that information i, I don't know whether it was inappropriate um on the face of it, it's difficult i agree I, I, with the home secretary it's difficult to see perhaps why they release such um intimate details um e e even if they might have been justified in giving a broader assessment but maybe they have their reasons so on the face of it there might be reasons to justify an inquiry, although I don't know that either. But again, we simply don't know the answers to these questions. And I'm not sure that speculating about them is very helpful at all to the police, mm. to the family or to anyone else. OK, so, so should the Home Secretary be getting involved in this now or is actually she helping to fuel speculation? Because, you know, the Home Secretary getting involved becomes a news headline, doesn't it? 
Well, the Home Secretary has no operational control over the police. And unless the police are failing in their duties, there's no has no statutory duty to intervene or statutory right, even power to intervene in, a, in an ongoing police inquiry. And again, uh, uh, she may well know more than we do. Uh, that's reasonable to believe. And it's quite reasonable the Home Secretary might be asking mm. for more detail about ongoing investigations and would be able to be provided with that detail. Okay. Um, whether she should make comments about them. All again, right. I simply don't know. And nor does anyone. All right. All right, Francis, thank you very much. That is Barrister Legal Commentator Francis Hall, Hall there. Uh, just talking a little bit, anyway, about the latest on the uh, Nicola Bully case. Um, we're going to move on from that now. We're going to move on from that because this is a big one for me today, right? A support package worth £650 million from the government. Uh, no, not to build housing. Not to build housing for the one million plus families already here in the UK who are on social housing. And that's before we've got stuck into the people who are sofa surfing and whatever. No. Instead, it's funding for councils in England to acquire houses for Ukrainian and Afghan refugees. In some cases, actually, they say they're going to build more houses themselves. Councils claim the grant money will reduce the reliance of bed and breakfasts as the government have been warned that increasing numbers of Ukrainians are facing homelessness and destitution. Well, speaking to GB News yesterday, Chairman of the 1922 Committee, Sir Graham Brady, told Camilla Tomine, fabulous show, by the way, you need to check that out, that he was deeply in favour of families being housed over single young men, something he thinks isn't currently happening. And, and this is interesting. Before we play a clip of this right now, just bear this in mind. There's two slightly different issues here. There's the initial pot of money for housing refugees, genuine refugees. There's a big question mark there over the fact that, oh, we can build houses, can we, and we can buy houses for people who've just come here, but we can't do it, quotes and quotes, for the indigenous British population. So that's the question there. But the other one on this about the hotels, the migrant hotel issues, which is slightly different, is Graham Brady, chairman of the Tory backbench 1922 committee, loads of clout. Loads of clout. He is a big cheese in the Tory party. And his seat in Altrincham and Sale is nearly part of that Cheshire triangle, OK? That quite leafy, affluent area of Cheshire. So he can go to the Tory party and say, sorry, we don't want a load of young men here. Unemployed young men. We don't know who they are, what their history is. Can you give us families instead? And they go, yeah, all right, Sir Graham. Yeah, you're gone. You, 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 have, you have the families, mate. What about the people of Bolton, of Blackburn, of Skegness, of all of these places who have had Knowlesley, of course, where we saw and are seeing mostly, vastly, mostly young men coming over here in those hotels. But Sir Graham Brady, he can pipe up and he, he, can, get, he can get families. Look, uh, let's play the clip. You've mentioned the Ashley Hotel in my constituency. Uh, people were very concerned mm. at the prospect. Initially, it was going to be uh, nearly 120 young men all unemployed necessarily because they're not allowed to work, and in the middle of a residential area uh, with a lot of schools around it, with school buses picking up straight outside it. And I lobbied to make sure that we had uh, families in the hotel rather than single young men. Yeah. And broadly, I think most of my constituents have recognised that was a, a good outcome in the circumstances. It's not ideal that we've got such large numbers, obviously, of illegal immigrants coming to the country, uh, but given that there are, uh, it's a much better outcome uh, for the area to have families there rather than single young men. Yeah, of course it is. And he can do that for his area. Lots of other MPs, they're not doing it or can't doing it. Now, shortly, ladies and gents, drum roll time, please, I will be talking about this very issue with, well, I mean, he's a new recruit, actually, isn't he? GB News' newest recruit, I think. It is Conservative MP Jacob Rees-Mogg. He joins me live on air in a matter of moments. But first, let's speak to... Dr. Nural Haq Nasimi, who is the director of the Afghanistan and Central Asian Association, which speak, seeks to help Afghans prosper in the UK. Thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Can you understand why homeless British people are very angry at the fact that the councils, possibly in their area, are building new housing or buying housing singularly to give to Afghan refugees? While I fully show my sympathy to those homelessness and thousands of the British people who are waiting for many, many years to get a council property, but at the same time, 
I have to admit, we cannot justify the approach of the foreign, uh, sorry, the Home Office, as well as the House of Parliament and the local MPs, how they approach the refugees from Afghanistan for the past 18 months since the evacuation started in August 2021. Thousands of those refugees from Afghanistan who have been evacuated in 2021, they are still with their families and small children, struggling and living and staying in the bridging hotels. And you can understand, living in a bridging hotel for 18 months, I think is worse than living in prison. While the people of Afghanistan inside, also they are facing serious mm. human rights and women's rights violations okay. back home. Should, given that we do not have enough social housing for people already here, in your view, should Afghan refugees skip the housing queue? Of course. First of all, uh, looking at the numbers of refugees from Ukraine, comparing to the numbers from Afghanistan, is, is, a, is completely very uh, different numbers. Uh, when we see that the number of Ukrainian refugees exceeded uh, over 200,000 refugees and the majority of those the Ukrainian they have now uh, a proper accommodation and some of the British companies and businesses and the com British community they uh, provided uh, the right accommodation for these people mm -hmm. but the number of people from Afghanistan being evacuated they are still struggling and living in the bridging hotel for 18 months. Okay all right so you obviously think that people who have just come here from Afghanistan who are refugees should skip the housing queue. Could, could I ask, just out of interest, what would you say to a young single mother who's been waiting for a house in, say, Basildon, which is one of the areas where this is, she's been waiting for a house to come up for several years. What would you say to her if that house gets taken by a, an Afghan refugee? Uh, I think this is the uh, responsibility of the House of Parliament and the local MPs, as well as the local authorities, who are responsible to uh, to uh, cope this crisis long and long time ago, mm. rather than waiting until we have we face the crisis after the uh, after the war in Afghanistan and then after the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Mm. And I think that we should have a preventative strategy or prevent a strategy in order to uh, to make sure that the people of uh, British people, they will not have any concerns towards the housing or any other benefits that they are entitled to get from the government. Look, thank you very, very much. And I think a lot of people will, by the way, will, will agree with some of what you said there, which is that in an ideal world, we would not be in a situation where there was almost a binary choice between who gets these houses now, refugees or already homeless Brits. Unfortunately, we are where we are. Dr. Nurel Haq, can I see me there? Thank you very much, Director of Afghanistan and Central Asian Association. I'm going to go live now to Westminster, where I can speak to Conservative MP for North East Somerset and the newest recruit right here of this parish is Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, thank you very, very much. It looks as though refugees are skipping the housing waiting list. How does that make you feel? Well, I, my greater concern is with illegal migration, and it's why I'm very keen to see the Rwanda scheme up and running, so that people who don't have a right to be in this country are moved swiftly, because I think that will lead to a decline in the numbers trying to get in. So that my priority would be dealing with illegal migration. When you're dealing with legal migrants, it seems to me that if they are refugees, they're genuine refugees, they have come from war-tour zones, we have a responsibility to them. That's why we've given them refugee status. But we must treat them well but not unfairly against our British compatriots. Now, with housing lists, there is a system for determining need, which takes into account a number of factors, including your existing housing, uh, the quality of your housing, the number of people in the property, and so on. And I think that refugees should be treated fairly with people who aren't refugees, rather than jumping the list, so to speak. OK, now, frankly, this situation might not have happened if we'd been able to build more social housing. And our economics and business editor said that there is roughly 24,000 net 
fewer social housing pretty much year on year and has been for a good number of years. Why have we ended up in this situation and, and why do councils now suddenly have the money to build homes and buy homes for people who, well, they've just got it? Yes, uh, uh, I mean, I absolutely agree with you on the broad um, programme of planning. We have an absolutely hopeless planning system that has needed fundamental reform for a long time. Uh, it's based on a 1940s socialist approach to building. We need to build more houses so that we can go back to being a home-owning democracy, as Margaret Thatcher was achieving. We're now finding the percentage of people owning their own home is declining. The age at which people buy their first home is rising. And we find that there's a shortage of social housing as well. And those are problems that come from our failure to build enough new properties. And that's something uh, mm -hmm. that I think it's a pity that this government hasn't dealt with. Can, can I ask you, a lot of emails coming in now from people saying to me <clears throat> that it looks as though our politicians, so in the round, so this is Labour and the Tories, aren't putting British people first. Are you putting British people first? Well, I'm joining GB News, and GB News <laughs> puts British people first. That's, um, you, you know, I'm, um, I put my voters first. I'm a democratic um, uh, politician that I am responsible and answerable to the people of North East Somerset. Now, I absolutely accept that we have a duty to refugees and we should treat them well. But the point you make about um, a, 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 a lady with a child who's been on a housing list for a long time, needing that security of housing, I think it should be done on the fair system that exists for determining need and that whether you're a refugee or not should not change your place on a waiting list. You shouldn't be disadvantaged by not being a refugee if you have a, a, a need for social housing. Jacob, thank you very much. And I've just got time to talk to you a little bit about what you're going to be delighting the viewers of GB News and our listeners and indeed the nation. We're international. Jacob, you're going global. What can we expect from Jacob Rees-Mogg right here in the hot seat on GB News? Well, I, I hope that we will have interesting and informative conversation very much led by what viewers are interested in. As I say, I'm a democratic politician and I'm responsive to what my employers think and my employers are the great British people. Lovely stuff. Jacob, I can't wait for it. And thank you very much for making time for us today. <laughs> Great to have your views on the show. Jacob Rees-Mogg there, Conservative MP for North Absolute East Somerset. And uh, there he is. And, uh, and he's going to be doing a good show here on GB News. So there we go. Right now, uh, OK, OK, some breaking news now, ladies and gentlemen, on our top story and the search for missing Nicola Bully. In the last few minutes... Lancashire Police have confirmed that they will hold a press conference at half past five. So that's exactly an hour from now. It will happen right here on this show. We will bring that to you live. So in an hour's time, we're going to go live to a press conference, Lancashire Police, and it's obviously an update on the search for missing Nicola Bully. And it does come after a body was found in the River Wire yesterday. Sometimes they can be a bit early with these press conferences, sometimes it can be a bit late. So you might as well keep watching, basically, is what I'm saying. We'll bring you the very latest from that. OK, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be back in two minutes. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwir, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> 
Because you sold it to Tony. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. The headlines this hour on GB News, and we have some breaking news for you. The families of the people killed in a shooting spree near Plymouth in 2021 have been speaking out against the investigation. Five people died, including a child, in a shooting rampage by 22-year-old Jake Davison. Well, today, the inquest jury said the victims were unlawfully killed. The inquest heard how Davison legally held a shotgun certificate and had an obsession with firearms at the same time. A lawyer for the victim's family says there has been a catastrophic failure at Devon and Cornwall Police. We'll bring you more on that in our next hour of news. Also in the headlines, junior doctors in England have voted overwhelmingly to strike for 72 hours next month over pay. The British Medical Association's announcement comes as more than 11,000 healthcare workers from the GMB and Unite Unions in England and Wales are striking today in their continuing dispute over pay and staffing. The workers striking include ambulance workers, paramedics and call handlers, and GMB says it's over a month since the government engaged in meaningful dialogue. President Biden has promised more than $500 million worth of aid to Ukraine today after making a surprise trip to its capital. It comes just days before the first anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Mr Zelensky said the visit was an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians. The US president said his country would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Putin thought Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. As you know, Mr. President, I said to you in the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. He thought he could outlast us. I don't think he's thinking that right now. God knows what he's thinking, but I don't think he's thinking that. And here, the partner of missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, has spoken of his family's agony after a body was found yesterday in the River Wire near to where she went missing. Lancashire police are working to provide a formal identification of the body, which was found in the water around a mile from where Nicola was last seen. They're currently treating the death as unexplained, and as Patrick said a short time ago, we're expecting a news conference with Lancashire police at around 5.30 this evening uh, for greater clarification on how they're treating this case. Nicola Bully, of course, disappeared more than three weeks ago while she was out walking her dog. That's all from me. Back in half an hour. Polly, thank you very, very much. Right, OK, is our history being eroded? All because of the threat of some uh, tin soup and spray paint. Frankly, some people would call it a mob, actually. Certain central London landmarks, such as the Cenotaph, which, as we all know, commemorates the war dead, and a bronze of Winston Churchill, Sir Winston Sir Churchill. The, 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 the reason, some would argue, that Britain is still Britain, although <laughs> the way it's going, have found themselves on a police list because they're seen as being at risk of vandalism by activists. So the statues and memorials like them have been labelled as contentious due to the perceived links to war, i.e. the fact that we won it in some cases there, and people who died fighting it. Imperialism, slavery, we all know the drill by now. Seriously, it's just getting far too much. Admiral Nelson, Robert Peel, 
Anyway, these are all on a secret danger list, and frankly, it's because sometimes mobs want to attack them. Joining me now in the studio is broadcaster and political commentator, fan favourite, it must be said as well here on GB News, it's Paula London. Paula, Hi. thank you very much. Now, this enrages me. We've seen that the dossier was compiled in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest in 2020. It includes those figures I've just mentioned there, Winston Churchill, Admiral Nelson, Robert Peel. Uh, why are these statues that commemorate the greats of British history under attack by mobs, and what should we do about it? Well, those people make me feel physically ill, for starters. And a lot of people don't realise, because of what happened, there was so much graffiti on them. A new bill was passed last year. It was called the the Desecration of War Memorials Bill. Mm. So Lee Anderson was actually a co-signer, so I'm very grateful for him. And now it's been passed in so 10 years. That's what you'll get, 10 years now, if you put graffiti on a war memorial mm. or a war grave. So a lot of people don't know that. So anyone at home that's thinking about doing it, 10 years, and I'd go further. I, I don't I'd... think they're watching GB News. Well, you people, never know. Yeah, no, on. some people <laughs> would watch, you know. And I think that those people should also be deported as well, because a lot of these people won't be born in this country. They're just here and have no respect for the country. A lot of people like myself have grandparents or grandfathers born in the war. So you think, just to, just to drill down on that then, so if you, if you think someone who wasn't born here yeah. decides to graffiti or vandalise a statue commemorating someone like Winston Churchill... Yes. ..you would deport them? 100%. I, right. I wouldn't think twice. 100%. Yeah, we have too many people in this country that don't respect our laws, our history, even Christianity. And I'm sick of it, to be honest with you. Well, the argument is that some people are making is that we should preemptively remove some of these statues and put them in museums to make sure that they are protected so that people don't even have the opportunity to vandalise them. What do you say to that? No, we, we can't just cater to these people. And a lot of people call themselves activists because they speak quite poshly or they went to private school. They're yobs, they're hooligans. Mm. You know, if they were working class, they'd be hooligans. They're not activists. They are the lowest of the low. And I feel like Khan is to blame as well because he cares more about the air quality in London than he cares about crime. He needs to get his facts straight and he needs to get his priorities correct. And teachers as well. A lot of left-wing teachers are teaching children awful things about our history. All they want to talk about is slavery. They don't want to speak about the great you know, Winston Churchill, what he did. You know, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be in a free country. You know, I mean, I, 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 I bring more. up an example very often, but it was at school in London where pupils burnt the Union flag. And I just think, well, where's that come from? What's that all about, really? I'm going to just play devil's advocate here and yeah. just say, OK, some people feel very, very, very strongly about the negatives of Winston Churchill's character or about the negatives of anyone, for example, who was linked to the slave trade or represented a time when Britain's values weren't up to their modern standard. And they feel as though they have a right in a free country to lob a load of soup or paint over it. I would tell them to leave the country if you feel that strongly and obviously don't go to central London where these memorials are if they offend you so much. We have too many people in this country as it is, so just leave if you don't like it. We're not catering to the left people, the woke people and the activists and, I mean, criminals. They're criminals. We can't just decide to change things because of a few people. Is it a good thing, though, that the police have drawn up this list? Because at least they are aware that people clearly want to... I suppose, attack these statues. Could we, if we're not moving them into a museum, how would you feel about, I don't know, encasing them in some kind of protective glass or, or making sure people couldn't get close to them? Or do you just find that idea quite depressing? I find that depressing and... They shouldn't be telling us what to do. That's been mm. there for a very, very long time. And I think more people need to know that it's 10 years now. Before this law was passed last year, you would get probably six months. Now it's 10 years. It's a lot longer. So more people need to know about that. They might, that might stop them from behaving this way. Do you think that this is a very, very vocal and active minority of people that actually maybe scare others into speaking out of it? So when you've got someone who's gobbing off about Winston Churchill and the negatives about here. I've got to be honest with you, I can't really understand that because, from for my money, Winston Churchill is just an out-and-out -out national hero and is one of the main reasons why we're all still here 
doing new shows like this and being able to talk yes. to each other freely. That's my interpretation. But I think what a lot of people don't realise he was the first person to bring in the minimum wage. So a lot of woke people should like that. So they mm. should be celebrating him. If it wasn't for him, you may not have had a minimum wage in this country. So he's done a lot of good for this country. Mm. So people need to read up their history books and look at the good, not the bad. You mentioned there the education element of it. Are you afraid of the future. We spoke earlier on about Roald Dahl, for example, yes. elements of that being told to, to appease the Wokies. And we, we hear about this a lot, about language in schools, what kids are taught, children, in fact, as well, at some point, according to some parents, not being able... The parents not being able to opt their child out of things like um, gay pride events, for example, and, and stuff like that, which is whatever that is. But uh, do you think that a lot of this issue starts in the education system then? I think it does. I'm not a parent. Some people don't think it's an issue at all, by the yeah. way. Yeah. If I was a parent, I'd be at the school every week complaining, mm. I know, because I wouldn't want my child to be... not to be able to read history mm. books and things and being taught something that isn't correct. A lot of these okay. teachers are just teaching their agenda. So, yeah, I would be very angry if so I you had So you would keep the statues the up? Yes. Uh, so you wouldn't protect... You wouldn't preemptively try to protect them? No. And you would, on top of the ten years in prison that people apparently can get if yes. you vandalise a statue... Yes. Paula London would deport people. Yes, 100%. Well, yes. there you go. I even paid for the airfare as well, as long as it wasn't too far. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's strong stuff from Paula. Look, thank you for coming into the thank studio. You. Hey, look, Thanks. if you're watching this, if you disagree, then get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.uk. You can have your say on all of this. Do you think that we should be, frankly, protecting our statues more? Should we preemptively put them in museums, etc., etc., etc.? Paula, thank you. Paula London thank there. Thank you. Right, now. A reminder of the news that I brought you a little earlier this hour, very much a, a shift in tone this now, ladies and gentlemen, because it's in the search for missing Nicola Bully. So this is the breaking line. Lancashire police have confirmed they will hold a press conference. That's going to come up quite shortly. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for this, because we will take that press conference live here. They did find a body in the search for Nicola Bully, yet to be confirmed as Nicola Bully, and we are going to be going live to a press conference by Lancashire police quite quite shortly, OK? So in the next hour. I've got a lot to come your way and um, that's all going to come your way very, very shortly. So make sure you stay tuned anyway. GBviews at gbnews.uk as well. Just remember, yes, we'll be going shortly anyway to a press conference in relation to the Nicola Bullock case. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. OK, ladies and gentlemen, now every single state primary school child in London 
is going to be given a free school meal. Just before I get stuck into that, yes, just a quick reminder what you can see on the strap on the bottom of your screen if you were watching us on TV. Uh, I'll say it out loud for the radio listeners as well. We're going to go shortly anyway to a live press conference from Lancashire Police. They've got an update in the search for missing Nicola Bully. A body was found in the river. We'll give you the latest on that. So is it Nicola? Is it not Nicola? Basically, that's happening shortly. But yes, every state primary school child in London is going to be given a free school meal. The £130 million scheme has been unveiled by Sadiq Khan. He's the mayor of London, everyone's favourite mayor. The fund will mean 270,000 more kids will be eligible for free school meals, saving families £440 per year. Now, it's aimed at helping low income parents. We all know the drill on this. But realistically, is this needed? Should the money be spent elsewhere? And. If we're being real about this, should parents, even on very low-income families, should they be able to feed their own kids? So, is this money well spent? Will it provide a lifeline to hundreds of London families? Or, frankly, are there some lazy parents out there? Joining us now is Molly Kingsley, author and co-founder of Us For Them, which is a group campaigning for the interests of children. Molly, thank you very much. Why does every child in London need a free school meal? Yeah, I mean, look, I do understand that argument, but personally, I think this is just such a clear cut case of a policy that should be done, not only because morally it's the right thing to do, but because it also makes economic sense. So the link between good nutrition and educational outcomes, health outcomes and employment outcomes is really, really strong and really clear. And actually, although I totally get the point that not every family needs this. I think enough do, and there's enough fluctuation between yeah. the ones that do at any one point and the ones that don't, particularly with the current cost of living crisis, that actually we should just see this as something we should do because we can do it and it makes sense for the economic future of our country. Molly, I've got to put this to you. A lot of people flat out refuse to believe that a parent cannot make a ham sandwich, buy an apple, some carrot sticks and a fruit juice for their kids on the cheap and that they are so desperate that they need the taxpayer to feed their kid at school. I mean, realistically, are, are we actually in that much of an emergency? Look, I, tot I totally hear you on that argument. I do really understand that. And the sad reality is there are many, many kids, 800,000, I think, who are below the poverty line and miss out currently on free school meals. And those are the kids, you know, the reality is that many of those parents are not... Okay making that happen. Now, I understand there is a parental responsibility. Of, like, of course there is. That is unarguable. But it's not happening. And actually, when you look at the sums of money that we spend and waste on policies mm. for adults, I just think this is so unarguable. I mean, you know, the COVID response, £370 yeah. billion, pounds, of which, what was it, £15 billion was um, literally wasted on fraud and error and another £37 billion on test and trace. So, you know, we are prepared to mobilise okay. these vast sums of money to protect adults, and there's no economic benefit from that, yet yeah. a sum of money to okay. protect children that would reap economic dividends, we should just do it. Molly, thank you very much. Just a very quick point of clarification. I heard the word fraud bandied about there. Things remain unproven. You get my gist. Right, Molly Kingsley there. Thank you very much. Author and co-founder of Us For Them. Now, I'm going to bring in, OK, uh, one of Sadiq Khan's main opponents. It's Sean Bailey. He's a regular on this channel. We all love Sean. He's a Conservative member of the London Assembly and former mayoral candidate. Sean, why is Sadiq Khan doing this? Is this virtue signalling at the expense of the British taxpayer? Look, let's just start by saying a couple of things. First, hello to all your listeners. The next thing is this, right? We welcome the idea that you'd help some of the poorer families in London make ends meet. We're having a cost of living crisis. It's real. And in certain households, it's really devastating. But let's be clear about what he's done. This is a one-off payment that won't exist next year. And what he's done, he's given payments to only primary school children. That means the parents of poor parents of secondary school children will now be paying for rich families' children to have free school meals. He has missed the point here. If you want to help the people of London, he should lower his costs. He's mm. put up council tax in his time by 57%. If he didn't do that, everybody, rich and poor, would be in a much better place. It's it's about the efficiency of the money you have in London, and he's missed the point. He's done this to take away the, the focus that people have had on his disastrous yeah. expansion of the ULIS scheme. Sean, can I just say, it's one of the reasons, potentially... And by the way, I completely refuse to believe that there are every single primary school... that the emergency in terms of feeding 
uh, primary school kids is so vast that every single one of them needs to get it. But is some of the reason why some parents won't be able to afford to feed their kids is because of the cost that Sadiq Khan is putting on their lives with other things like you, Les, and all of that? 100%. Anybody, even if you don't live in London, you'll be well aware how expensive London is. And one of the most expensive parts of London is the Mayor of London. Again, he's risen council tax, his portion, by 57% in his time as Mayor. He's about to give the poorest Londoners a £12.50 daily charge to drive their car when he yeah. expands the, the ultra-low emission zone. So let's be clear, he's the Mayor of London who's very expensive. That's before I mentioned the, the rise in public transport fares. And before he blames it on, on COVID and the outbreak, he had this planned in his 2019-2020 business plan. It was always coming because he's been inefficient. I just want to make the point again, there mm. is families in London who are struggling who welcome this and mm. we should give them this help. But well, we shouldn't be giving it to everyone because there's also lots of rich families in London who could pay yeah. their own way. And, and when you do it like this, it means that poorer families of secondary age children end mm. up footing the bill and they just can't afford it. Sean, thank you very much. Sean Bailey there, of course, who is a Conservative member of the London Assembly and a former mayoral candidate regular here on GB News. So, look, there's that discussion. And it's not too London-centric, this people, because I can guarantee you when the mayoral election comes up and all of this, you're going to end up in your area with similar schemes being posed. And it's worthwhile asking. £12.50 a day, some of these charges, to take your car off your driveway and just drive it to work. How many school dinners would twelve pound fifty buy? You could you could take you could take them out for dinner for twelve pound fifty a day, couldn't you? All these school kids. We're moving on. Boris Johnson. He's hit the headlines this weekend after warning the prime minister that dropping the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill would be a great mistake. Well, it's also been discovered, and I think this is the line, frankly, that Boris Johnson actually actually could have caused serious challenges to Rishi Sunak's campaign following the resignation of Liz Truss. He had the numbers. He had the numbers from MPs. This was confirmed by Sir Graham Brady. He had enough backers to support him and could have stood to become the Tory leader and Prime Minister again, and he stood aside. Speaking to Camilla Tomine on GB News yesterday, the chairman of the Backbench 1922 Committee, Sir Graham Brady, confirmed that Boris could have put himself into the race. He chose not to. Let's have a little listen to this. Get a load of this. Boris Johnson's team asked us to verify this, which we did, uh, that two candidates had the requisite number of uh, parliamentary supporters to go forward, Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson. You did put, just to say on that, because there was some scurrilous talk that Boris Johnson didn't get those 100, but he did. Yes, we verified that. Yes. And his team asked us to do that, and one of the officers of the 22 went specially to do that and confirmed that he had 110 parliamentary uh, party members nominating him. So he could have gone forward, he chose not to. Wow. So there you go. It wasn't just noise. Boris Johnson did have the numbers and he chose to stand aside. Olivia Utley joins me now in the studio, GB News' political reporter. Olivia, big news this on Boris. I think many people wishing he hadn't stood aside. Well, it's very interesting, this, and it's very important going forwards as well because, as you mentioned earlier, Boris Johnson has been intervening on the um, Rishi Sunak's plan for a new Brexit deal and saying that it would be a grave mistake to replace the current deal with the protocol bill mm. uh, with this new deal. And it's worrying Rishi Sunak and his allies that Boris Johnson and his backers could uh, vote down any new Brexit deal in the House of Commons. And Liz Truss might be among Boris Johnson's backers. Mm. So it's fascinating, actually, to find out exactly how many backers, how many really strong allies Boris Johnson does have. And if he had enough to, to put his name forward as a leadership candidate, then he has enough to cause real problems for Rishi Sunak's new Brexit deal. And will it cause problems? Because, you know, let's be honest with you, if Boris Johnson pipes up, I know a a lot of people will be saying, well, we wish we had Boris back anyway. Rishi Sunak already in hot water. Well, I mean, you know, how bad is this for Rishi? He's found out that Boris Johnson, frankly, was probably much more popular than he was. Well, in terms of the the, the Brexit bill, which is the, the first hazard facing Rishi Sunak, it almost definitely will get through the Commons, even if there is a back, big backlash from Conservative backbench MBs, because Labour has said that they will back any deal on the Northern Ireland Protocol just to get the issue out of the way. But we know that no... 
British Prime Minister wants to be winning votes no. with the help of the opposition. And in the well, longer term, of course, having Boris Johnson there causing these sorts of issues, this isn't yeah. going to be the f first. This isn't going to be the last time that this happens. Olivia, thank you very, very much as ever. Olivia Utley, there, our political reporter, just just really hammering home that point made. It's right here on GB News. Camilla Tomine's fabulous Sunday show, by the way. Check that out about the fact that Boris Johnson definitely had the numbers. Do you want Boris back? Do you think he should have stood aside? And what a terrible look it'll be for Rishi Sunak too if he does it. And some people are branding it betray the right of his own party and getting something through with the support of the Labour Party. Would that tell you everything you need to know about the state of politics in this country? Time for a couple of emails very quickly on this. I've been asking you, in light of the fact that councils are spending millions of pounds of your money, my money, to build or buy new homes to exclusively put refugees in, not the one million people already living here on a waiting list, should we be housing Brits first? Caroline says... Absolutely appalled at the government expecting local councils to house refugees when our own people are left to sort themselves out, whether they're able or not. One more quick one. Mary from Edinburgh. New council housing should be built for British people first. It's always the hard-working class who suffer. And you know what? In the current climate, it is a terrible look, I think. I get that these people have got to go somewhere, but what about people who are already here? GBviews at gbnews.uk. I'm going to be returning to that later on in the show. Should we house British people first? But in the next hour... Oh, very shortly, actually, I'm going to be going live to Lancashire, where the police are giving a press conference to update the public on the search for missing mum Nicola Bully. She went missing more than three weeks ago. The investigation's been called a shambles. The independent diver who was brought in to look for her, he's being dug out in the media left, right and centre now. Terrible communications. Well, a body has been found, and we will bring you the very latest from Lancashire Police on that. I will also be doing that big debate on whether or not local councils should use money to house Brits first or refugees first. So all of that coming your way very, very shortly. Big update this, imminent from the Lancashire Police in the case of Nicola Bully. I'll be back in a tick, don't go anywhere. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Dubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Dubry, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, you are live at five with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Now, very shortly, we'll be crossing live to Lancashire as police hold a news conference after a body was found yesterday in the search for missing Nicola Bully. We'll bring you the latest on that. That's coming your way, so it could happen at any moment, actually, so make sure you stay tuned. Also this hour, this is a controversial one to get your teeth stuck into. Brand new homes 
for refugees. Councils are spending millions of pounds buying or building properties for those fleeing conflict. But what about British people? We've got a million people already, apparently, on a housing waiting list. Should the money be spent to house Brits? First, that's what I want to know from you. And now all these cancel culture snowflakes, they've come for Roald Dahl of all people. He can't call Augustus Gloop fat. Well, he, he's, he's enormous now. I would rather be called fat than enormous, I think. But Augustus Gloop, doesn't matter what the snowflakes say about him, he's a massive greedy fatty. Fatty, fatty, bum, bum. The world's gone mad. Oh, actually, you can't even say that anymore, can you? Get in touch. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. I'll also be trying to find Prince Andrew a job, because apparently he's fallen on hard times. We'll be reading out Prince Andrew's CV. Let's get the man gainfully employed, shall we? But the big one, should we be housing people, British people, already on a housing waiting list before we're building or buying new homes for refugees. Your views, GB views at gbnews.uk. Right now, though, it's your headlines with Polly. Patrick, thank you. Good evening to you. Our top story on GB News. President Biden has promised more than $500 million worth of aid to Ukraine after making a surprise trip to its capital. It comes just days before the first anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Mr Zelensky said the visit was an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians. The US president said his country would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Putin thought Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. As you know, Mr. President, I said to you in the beginning, he's counting on us not sticking together. He was counting on the inability to keep NATO united. He was counting on us not to be able to bring in others on the side of Ukraine. He thought he could outlast us. I don't think he's thinking that right now. God knows what he's thinking, but I don't think he's thinking that. Here, the partner of missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, has spoken of the family's agony after a body was found yesterday in the River Wire near to where she went missing. Lancashire police are working to provide a formal identification of the body, which was found in the water around a mile from where Nicola was last seen. They're currently treating her death as unexplained. The 45-year-old disappeared more than three weeks ago while walking her dog. The families of the people killed in a shooting spree near Plymouth in 2021 have spoken out against the investigation. Five people died, including a three-year-old girl in a shooting rampage by 22-year-old Jake Davison. Today, the inquest jury said the victims were unlawfully killed. The inquest heard how Davison legally held a shotgun certificate and had an obsession with firearms. A lawyer for the family says there's been a catastrophic failure at Devon and Cornwall Police. The system has hopelessly failed us. In particular, the Devon and Cornwall Police Force has failed us. The evidence we have heard during this inquest over the past five weeks is a consistent story of individual failures breathtaking incompetence and systemic failings within every level of the firearms licensing unit of the Devon and Cornwall Police. Junior doctors in England have voted overwhelmingly to strike for 72 hours next month over pay. The Health Secretary Steve Barclay says he's just deeply disappointed by the decision. The British Medical Association's announcement comes as more than 11,000 healthcare workers from the GMB and Unite Unions in England and Wales are striking today in their continuing dispute over pay and staffing. Now, the most dangerous domestic abusers will be added to the Sex Offenders Register as the Home Office vows to treat violence against women as a national threat. The government plans to invest up to £8.5 million over the next two years to fund specialist support programmes for victims. Domestic abuse charities affected around 2.5 million people in England and Wales in the last year. The Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, says the changes are needed. I'm changing the law to ensure that there's more robust monitoring of perpetrators. We're introducing measures to ensure that we will be able to tag uh, offenders of domestic abuse uh, and we will be also adding uh, offenders of domestic abuse onto the violent and sex offenders register. Uh, and also all police chiefs uh, and forces around the country will now be put on a footing to deal with violence against women and girls as a national threat.
Suella Braverman. Now, the Foreign and Northern Ireland Secretaries are to speak with the European Commission Vice President later as negotiations continue over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Number 10 has denied reports the Prime Minister has been forced to delay announcing a breakthrough amid a backlash from his own MPs. The DUP and backbench Tories say it won't support a deal which retains oversight from the European Court of Justice. But the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says there's a real window of opportunity now to move forward. The UK and the EU have obviously edged closer together. The question now is whether the Prime Minister is strong enough to get it through his own backbenchers. Um, and what I've said is, um, on Northern Ireland, the national interest comes first. So we will put party politics to one side. We will vote with the government if there's a deal to vote for. And so the Prime Minister doesn't have to rely on his backbenchers. Um, you know, we in the Labour Party are putting country first and party second. Sir Keir Starmer. That's all from me for now. I'm back in half an hour. All right, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of breaking at the top of the five here because Lancashire Police have confirmed they will hold a press conference in the next few minutes, really, which will bring you live, and that is, of course, in relation to missing Nicola Bully. As we all know, deeply mysterious case, massive controversies from the way the police handled it, even now towards the independent dive team. The chap said that she wouldn't be in the river, all of this stuff. Well, they did find a body, and we are going to be bringing you a press conference live from Lancashire Police imminently. And currently, the latest is that an ex-Scotland Yard superintendent has called for an independent inquiry into Lancashire Police's handling of the case of missing mother Nicola Bully. Former officer Nusrit Metab said that there were serious questions to be answered into the force's handling of the investigation into the dog walker who went missing three weeks ago. The force has faced a load of criticisms from deciding to release personal information about Nicola's health. Also, frankly, just the fact, really, if we're getting down to brass tacks on this, that so many people and so many resources can be pumped into searching a quite small stretch of river and not find... A body, and a body has indeed now turned up. Whether or not it's hurt, we will have to wait and see. But that body was found less than a mile away from where Nicola disappeared. We'll be bringing you a press conference imminently, so make sure you stay with us here, because Lancashire Police will be holding that press conference and we will go to it live. But to shed some more light on this, I am joined in the meantime by retired Scotland Yard detective. It's Hamish Brown, MBE. Hamish, we await, obviously, what Scotland, uh, what Scotland Yard, what Lancashire Police have to say in this press conference shortly uh, but if this body does turn out to be nicola have they been vindicated do you think well vindicated was just the word good afternoon to you uh, patrick vindicated was the the word i i was thinking they've approached this in in my view in a very level-headed way they weren't going to be pushed from pillar to post um that they've made their inquiries and um and it would seem that they were on the right track all along. The, the fact it took so long for a body to be found, I mean, I, I know nothing about tides and I can only be mm. guided by uh, those experts, but it would appear, and I'll choose my words carefully on this, that whatever is in the river, whatever it may be, will go one way and then because of change of tides will come back. Also, the weather, I understand, has a significant um, dealings with the effect on, on the actual tides. Right. So um, it probably won't be as simple as that. What does disappoint me, and you alluded to it, uh, an independent search team was brought in, mm. and they said she wasn't there. Well, um, uh, and now say, with, despite their solar equipment, it was in the rushes, and, and the solar equipment doesn't do rushes. Well... Um, you know, she's either there or she's not. I, I get, I do, that, I do that, get that, Hamish. I, I do get that. And, and Peter Falding has been on this show numerous times. And he was on Breakfast, our own Breakfast show earlier today, yeah. essentially defending himself, saying what you've said there. But I've got to ask you: Did the police do rushes? Because they were out in force as well, weren't they? And they didn't find her. Well, absolutely. But uh, I don't know 
what equipment they had if they had the, the same equipment as private companies. Oddly enough, private companies can have more access to uh, specialist equipment mm. simply because the money and resources they have, they can go into one particular specialist aspect, whereas police have to spread their budget over mm. a lot of things. But um, uh, she has, well, a body has been found. Um, identification processes will have to be uh, followed and this can be generally speaking and bear in mind um since retirement i've done a lot of work in the criminal justice system okay. which has included identification of the deceased and i know full well that in the first instance you look for visual well sometimes it's not appropriate or not convenient well, that, that's probably the, that, that will be the okay. case here. So moving on, you're going to look for jewellery, clothing, items uh, which will personally identify yeah. the person. The family will be approached and things like, were there particular operation scars, tattoos? I don't know. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you, Hamish, in your, in your, in your experience, bearing in mind, and we are about to go to a press conference by Lancashire Police. We'll take that live here on GB News in a matter of moments. But this body was found yesterday morning. Yes. How long, in your professional opinion, can it take to identify a body? I mean, we've obviously got this press conference coming up. One would imagine there might be some development there, reading between the lines. But is that quite quick, or should we be prepared to wait a bit longer, maybe? Well, absolutely. If there is, well, there's not going to be a visual identification, but there might be other telling points which will quickly identify the person. So th that can that can turn round enormously quickly. On the other side, if it is needed for DNA and there are troubles taking samples because the person's been in the water some time, yeah. that, that can be quite a, quite a bit longer. So there isn't an actual full answer at the moment, no. but hopefully it will be pretty clear who this person is, and at least we can go to the next stage, whatever that may will be. Well, that will be a post-mortem examination. Very, 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 oh. very quickly, Hamish, yes. on this now. Um, do you, in, do you anticipate that in the next few moments at this press conference we're probably going to have a conclusion to this Nicola Bully case, do you think, just quickly? Well, it, it's interesting. They've suddenly called the police conference now, so one would assume they have something uh, relevant to say. And uh, well, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, I think it's significant that the conference has been called now. OK, Hamish, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, although we do always talk under rather bleak circumstances, I'm afraid, but it's Hamish Brown, MBE there, retired Scotland Yard detective inspector. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that breaking strap that you will be able to see on your screens if you're watching us on telly, I will talk you through it. If you're listening to us on radio, Lancashire Police are holding a press conference very shortly where I think it's reasonable to expect or suspect that we might be about to have a conclusion to this Nicola Bully case that has gripped the nation for the best part of three and a bit weeks now. A body was found in the River Wire about a mile or so from where Nicola went missing that length of time ago. Make sure you stay tuned to us here on GB News because we'll throw to that as soon as it happens. Now, I think we've got time before that possibly to squeeze in another story here which has been absolutely massive in our inbox today and it has got you all incredibly, incredibly wound up. And I'm not surprised. And it's because of this. The facts of this are stark, so get your ears around this, OK? Councils in England, now they've been given a share of a £500 million pot of cash to acquire houses, so to either buy or build new houses for Afghan and Ukrainian refugees, just exclusively for Afghan and Ukrainian refugees. It's part of an effort to ensure that those who fled from war have a safe place to live. And the government is being warned that increasing numbers of Ukrainians, they're facing homelessness and destitution, so we get all of that. But, of course, this has sparked massive concern. In fact, it's sparked outrage. I'll go as far as to say it's actually sparked outrage about who gets what in terms of housing. We have around a million people already here on a housing waiting list. There are lots of people, homeless military veterans, for example, young single mums, people like that who've been on a housing waiting list for years and years and years, people who are sofa surfing. They can't seem to get a property from their local council. But new arrivals, albeit refugees, new arrivals... Wallop, there you go, have a house. And it's not just about building houses and it's not just about the ones that they are buying. Some of the ones that they're buying are coming out of the right to buy scheme. So these specifically designed for people who are 
need help to buy, right? Need help to buy a house. People who are not earning a lot of money, first-time buyers. What's that going to do for property stock in your area? There is a lot to talk about here because the flip side of it is massive, which is, well, what else do we do with these people? Where do we put them? Joining me now is Conservative Surrey councillor, it's Michael Cooper. I'm also joined by James Usul as well, who's head of communications at Price Out, who campaign for affordable houses. Look, thank you very much. Uh, I will start with you, Michael, if that's OK. A lot of people saying, pretty straightforward, housing should go to Brits first. Your views. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, yes, uh, I don't think I quite take that view. Um, the issue I have is to do with the, the scheme that Sandridge District Council has decided to pursue. And the scheme uh, doesn't actually require the, the building of anything at all. Uh, and given our current woeful lack of house building over the past decade, uh, this is leaving a lot of people, as you quite rightly say, living in poor, substandard, inadequate accommodation. Mm. Um, well, not only that, of course, uh, people who, as you said, like to get on the housing ladder can't because the government is effectively funding the purchase of those houses. Uh, I think then to start going down uh, this route of only certain categories of people can actually mm. get those houses really causes a problem. Uh, I certainly see from our legal report on Tandridge uh, that uh, a council may do anything provided it doesn't, uh, is not prohibited by legislation. Um, and under the okay. equality legislation, uh, it states quite categorically that a, an authority must have due regard to eliminate discrimination. Now, this clearly is a discriminatory ah. policy. So you think it's discriminatory? Who, just before I go to James, and I just want to drill, drill down on this, Michael, quite quickly for me, you think that potentially this policy to build and buy new houses exclusively for refugees, what, discriminates against the indigenous population? Brett? It, 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 as far as I'm concerned, it should do neither. At the end of the day, the refugees have a need, and that need needs to be okay. assessed by Tandridge district officers. And they will therefore be put at the appropriate point in the housing list. That okay. seems to me to be the way to do it, to keep equality going, because otherwise right. it is racist. We're choosing people based on their race, not on their need. OK, Michael, I'll come back to you. James, I'll bring you in here now. £2 million set to be used to build 17 new homes in Basildon. Boston Borough Council, they're going to buy eight homes, apparently. Birmingham, they might buy as many as 50. North Northamptonshire Council, get a load of this. They're not just going to use the pot of money given by the government. They'll use £3.7 million of its own cash to match a government grant over the forthcoming financial year. If you're a young single mum or a homeless veteran in those areas, do you have a right to be angry at the fact that your council appears to be prioritising refugees over the indigenous population? I think young single mothers and homeless veterans shouldn't be angry at refugees or immigrants. They should be angry at the government who have uh, scaled back on their housing targets. Make no mistake, this is a housing supply problem, not a refugee problem. Yeah, I, I'm going to get you to elaborate on that because that is a really good point, James, actually. When I look at some of the figures here, we've had something like net 24,000 fewer social houses available year on year for a very, very long time. And this is indeed a housing problem. But the concern, James, I think, for people is what's got councils and the government's backside in gear when it comes to building houses is the fact that they want to build them for refugees. Shouldn't they have been more focused primarily already on people who were already here? We both know there's a housing crisis. Well, I think, you know, we recognise the importance of providing safe and affordable homes for refugees who are fleeing war-torn countries, and God knows the conditions they've gone through. But, you know, like you said, I think it's important to ensure that there is enough affordable housing uh, for everyone, including those already living in the area. I think the especially important point to make is that we need more houses mm. uh, with a focus in the least affordable areas, in areas like London and the South East. Yeah, indeed. And, and this is a huge issue for loads of people. And, Michael, I'll ask you the same question, if that's all right. I mean, you are a Conservative councillor, and there will be plenty of people living in areas in the country right now who will think that this policy discriminates against 
Brits, there will be other people who will say, well, what else are we supposed to do with these people? And I want to ask you that question, Michael. If not this, what else do we do with the refugees from Afghanistan or Ukraine? Well, I think the point's been made. There, isn't, there hasn't been sufficient housing. Uh, and it's not just the last five, ten. It's more like 20 years uh, when we started uh, with EU people coming in. Uh, and we allowed them. But the problem is we've never been providing the accommodation or the hospitals or the schools that have been necessary to support this influx of people. And that is what... Oh. I think we might, have, we might have got Michael frozen there. Well, James, I suppose that gives you a bit more time here, doesn't it, really? James, look, should we realistically be saying now to ordinary Brits, we're going to build one for one or we're going to buy one for one when it comes to this housing market issue, when it comes to the, uh, the refugees, etc.? Because programmes like this are just for refugees from Afghanistan and Ukraine. Can't local councils, James, say well, I will do one house for a refugee and one for, yeah, you know, I'll keep using this example, homeless veterans or young single mums. Well, I think it's important to take into uh, account the legal side of things. You know, providing housing for refugees is not just a moral imperative. You know, it's a legal obligation under the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention. Signatory countries such as the UK are required to provide refugees with access to housing and other basic needs. And, you know, by denying refugees uh, access to housing, we risk violating international mm. law, failing in our duty to protect the most vulnerable. OK, James, look, thank you very much. It's James Usel there, who is head of communications at Price Out. They campaign for affordable house prices. Before that, we did have Surrey Tory councillor Michael Cooper as well. Look, James mentioned there, and I'm sympathetic towards this for you, don't get me wrong, he mentioned there about the idea of our international duty. What about our national duty? I'm getting email after email after email. I like this one from my GBviews at gbnews.uk. The priority for public housing should be for our own homeless, especially our ex-military. Uh, these people have been neglected for years. It would be wholly justified to build one for one. And I'm getting emails in in droves. We're going to keep going to them throughout the course of this show, ladies and gentlemen. But a lot of you are very angry out there at the fact that all of a sudden, here's a load of money, here's wheelbarrows full of cash to be able to either build houses or buy houses for refugees when people have been trying to get on these housing waiting lists and trying to get themselves somewhere to live for years. Other people saying, hey, it's justified. It's justified because where else do we put them? GBviews at gbnews.uk. Quick reminder, we're moving on now. Quick reminder, I'll be going live in just a matter of minutes, actually, to Hutton in Lancashire because, in fact, if you're watching us now on GB News, what you can see there are live pictures outside the headquarters of Lancashire Police. And the reason why we're showing you that is because they are going to hold a press conference very shortly in the search for missing Nicola Bully. I'll bring you that live here. Do not miss it, people. I'll be back in two minutes and we'll bring you that press conference live. OK, big update. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture 
and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Yeah, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. OK, as you can see, that breaking news trap is up right there, and with good reason, because in just a matter of moments, we're going to be going live to outside Lancashire Police's headquarters, which we can see on the screen there. If you're listening on radio, basically, it's outside Lancashire Police's headquarters because there's going to be an update on the Nicola Bully case. Now, this case has gripped the nation. It's been one of the most mysterious cases that I've ever reported on, and everyone, rightly or wrongly, everyone has had a view on this. Nicola Bully went missing just over three weeks ago. Mum of two, she was out walking her dog, and then, as we all know, disappeared. And as a result of that, then, it's caused massive, massive, massive searches. The police used unprecedented resources. Now, a body was found in the River Wire yesterday, yesterday morning, and we are waiting for an update, confirmation as to whether or not that is Nicola. The family have said they are bracing for the worst. Loads of unanswered questions here, and this is what we're hoping to get from Lancashire Police outside their headquarters. Loads of unanswered questions. Firstly, of course, the obvious one, which is, is this body Nicola? OK, well, we'll have to wait and see about that. How on earth the unprecedented amount of resources that the police used to search and scour what was quite a small stretch of river. This body, if it is Nicola, this body was found less than a mile away from where she's believed to have gone missing initially. How on earth it's taken this long? We're also going to get a reaction from the police, I would expect, I would hope, as to why their communication has been so poor on this, revealing very personal information about Nicola that has, I think, caused massive distress to her family. Also, as well... We're going to be discussing whether or not Lancashire Police now actually have been vindicated as a result of this. Very shortly, we'll be going live to that press conference where we'll keep our eyes on those microphones, ladies and gentlemen, and bring it to you as soon as we can. Martin Underhill joins me now, former police and crime commissioner, senior lecturer. Martin, the police have, of course, called a press conference. In your professional opinion, what do you, what do you anticipate that we're going to hear from them? Because I've said there are loads of unanswered questions. Presumably, they're going to answer at least some of them. Good afternoon, Patrick. Um, in my view, you'll get two things in the next few minutes. The first will be formal identification of um, Nicola, and the second will be the results of the Home Office post-mortem, uh, both recently achievable in 36 hours. So they're the two things I'm expecting to hear, um, and anything else will be a bonus, quite frankly. So just to emphasise on that one, Martin, you think that there might even be a, a, a result of a post-mortem, is that right? I would expect a post-mortem to be held by now. Um, a home office post-mortem is normally held on an unexplained death, which is what Lancashire Police are calling this at the moment. Um, and there are numerous home office pathologists around the country. It's quite achievable to do this within 36 hours, um, and it's also quite achievable to identify Nicola's body. So they're the two things I'm expecting to have as a takeaway from the press conference coming in a moment. But we, we all know the legacy of this case isn't going to disappear after a press conference. 
No, indeed. And just to fill people in, there is some movement now outside Lancashire Police's headquarters where we can see at least one individual who is wearing a police uniform walking towards the microphones, flanked either side by uh, some other people. They are carrying documents and I would expect that one of them is going to start talking soon. This is Lancashire Police headquarters and the latest update on Nicola Bully. Let's go to it. But yesterday we recovered Nicola Bully from the River Wire. Nicola's family have been informed and are of course devastated. Our thoughts are with them at this time, as well as with all her loved ones and the wider community. We recognise the huge impact that Nicola's disappearance has had on her family and friends, but also on the people of St Michael's. We would like to thank all of those who have helped during what has been a hugely complex and highly emotional investigation. Today's development is not the outcome any of us would have wanted, but we hope that at least it can begin to provide some answers for Nicola. They remain foremost in our thoughts. The case is now being handled by His Majesty's Coroner. The family have asked that we read a statement on their behalf. I'll now hand over to Detective Chief Superintendent Pauline Stables to do that. Nicola's family have asked that we release the following statement on their behalf as follows. Our family liaison officers have had to confirm our worst fears today. We will never be able to comprehend what Nikki had gone through in her last moments and that will never leave us. We will never forget Nikki, how could we? She was the centre of our world. She was the one who made so special and nothing will cast a shadow over that. Our girls will get the support they need from the people who love them the most and it saddens us that one day we will have to that the press and members of the public accuse their dad of wrongdoing, misquoted and vilified friends and family. This is absolutely appalling. They have to be accountable. This cannot happen to another family. We tried last night to take in what we had been told in the day, only to have Sky News and ITV making contact with us directly when we expressly asked for privacy. They again have taken it upon themselves to run stories about us, to sell papers and increase their own profits. It is shameful they have acted in this way. Leave us alone now. Do the press and other media channels and so-called professionals not know when to stop? These are our lives and our children's lives. To those who genuinely helped and supported us privately, we thank you. The community support in St Michael's, friends, neighbours and strangers has been nothing short of comforting and heartwarming. Friends, you know who you are, thank you. Our hearts truly <coughs> break for others who have missing loved ones. Keep that hope alive. Finally, Nikki. You are no longer a missing person. You have been found. We can let you rest now. We love you. Always have and always will. We will take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. OK. OK, ladies and gentlemen, you're back now with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Now, that was the press conference outside Lancashire Police headquarters They've confirmed there that the body that was found in the River Wire yesterday morning is indeed that of missing mother Nicola Bully. So, unfortunately, Nicola's body has, of course, been found. Uh, the comments there that were made by an individual reading a statement out on behalf of the family were, were pretty clear. What they were saying was that the family now wants to be left alone and indeed wanted to be left alone earlier on yesterday and they were 
saying that over the course of this investigation and this search for Nicola, the family and the relatives have been vilified, they've been misquoted, and they've even accused Paul, her partner, of uh, wrongdoing. That's, of course, been incredibly hurtful. There's two little girls there who uh, have lost a mother and that they didn't want any of that stuff. And I think that those people who are doing that online, etc., of course, are pretty horrible people. I just want to recap where we are, OK? So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us here on GB News, we've just had a press conference there, Lancashire Police confirming that, sadly, Nicola Bully's body has now been identified. She was in that river all along, found less than a mile away from where she was believed to have entered the river. Of course, more details will emerge in the fullness of time, cause of death, etc. They didn't go into that as it currently stands, but they did say that that body that was found in the river wire around a mile away from where she was believed to have gone into the river was indeed that of missing mum of two, Nicola Bully, who, if we take you back now, at 8.26am, all the way back, all the way back on January the 27th, Nicola Bully left her home with her two daughters. Those girls, it's worth remembering as well, aged just six and nine, bless them. Dropped them off at school, had a brief conversation with another parent around 15 minutes later, and then, as we all know, the mystery started. The mystery began. She took her spaniel willow for a walk along the path of the river wire at 8.43 a.m. 8.53 a.m., she sent an email to her boss. She was on a Teams call, a work Teams call, one of those group meetings. Uh, she was seen by a witness at 9.10 a.m. And then her phone was back in the area of the bench at 9.20 a.m. The meeting ended shortly after that, and we all know what happened following that. Police were called. They responded quickly, and they responded quickly in a big way, as they made it clear, because there were those specific vulnerabilities. And we remember when they revealed that, don't we? People were asking, well, hang on a minute, why was Nicola's case treated with such vigour so early on, and they came out, said the police, didn't they? It was due to specific vulnerabilities, and that's when another layer of controversy started because they then went on to reveal Nicola had issues with alcohol. Those issues had resurfaced. People are saying that's incredibly bad of the police to have revealed that. Other people saying actually what they should have done is reveal it earlier and reveal it to the individual who was in charge of the independent dive team, Peter Falding, who says that it would have changed his search. They also said that if she'd been struggling with hormonal issues, again, I don't particularly like saying that myself on air, but that's what they said. So there you go. In relation to the menopause, Lancashire Constabulary deployed drones, helicopters, police search dogs as part of this major operation. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, three and a bit weeks down the line with a press conference you've just heard there was more of a statement really wasn't it nicola bully's body has now formally been identified and nicola who went missing three and a bit weeks ago was found in that river i'm going to go back now to martin underhill his former police and crime commissioner a senior lecturer and former met police detective peter blexley also joins the fray for us now uh, martin didn't quite predict everything that we were about to hear there there's no formal uh, results of a post-mortem or anything like that but peter I'll, I'll start with you on this particular occasion peter what, what did you make of the statements that were read out there the police initially saying that of course nicola Bully's body has now been identified. Another statement on behalf of the family saying that they are clearly absolutely devastated but also livid with the media for being, as they would argue, it far too intrusive. Uh, just, Peter, your, your, your general take on what we've just heard there. Yeah, I wasn't surprised at all that Lancashire Police stuck very closely to the narrow facts that Nicola had unfortunately been identified. Um, and that it was merely thereafter a family statement that was read out. We know how much criticism Lancashire Constabulary has attracted recently for what I have described, described as a ham-fisted media strategy and much of the messaging I've, I've, I've thought has been very poor throughout this missing person inquiry. So, yeah, I'm not surprised mm. in the slightest that they kept it very short, kept it to the very, very narrow facts, and the matter, as we were told, is now in the hands of the coroner. OK, Peter, I'll come back to you. Martin, I'll bring you in. Sorry, I think you thought you were on air then a second ago, Martin. You're definitely on air now. OK, so what was your initial response to what we just heard there? Police statement, Nicola Bully's body... Oh, no, well, unfortunately, we appear to have lost Martin. Peter, I'll stick with you, actually. Peter, uh, clearly the family are very, very distressed. I think the big question for me, and for a lot of people, Peter, will be... Why has it taken so long, with all of these resources, to find what is now definitely Nicola Bully's body and was located 
less than a mile away from where her phone was found and the dog was found, Peter. Yes, indeed, because, of course, Lancashire Police were very keen to tell us last Wednesday about the experts that they'd had on board, leaders in their field, national experts and the like. And they told us, and I'll just get this wording right, they told us that they were following the nationally recognised searching doctrine. Well, it would appear that those experts and that searching doctrine might have to be looked at again because despite the searches and the efforts and the divers and the equipment and everything that was applied into this search, it ended up with a couple of members of the public who were walking on a Sunday morning to... Uh, discover this body floating in the water. Peter, so once again, that will be another aspect that will have to be looked at. A lot, of the, a lot of people will find that incredibly hard to understand, how with all of these resources, with an independent dive team as well, that it ended up being dog walkers three and a bit weeks after Nicola went missing. Lancashire Police, for their part, were adamant that she was in the river. Whatever information or intelligence that they had, they were adamant that she was in the river. And now, clearly, she was in the river all along. Let's for a second just forget how long it took for her to be found and the fact that it wasn't the police who found her. Just bearing in mind that she was now in that river, have the Lancashire police been vindicated? Or, frankly, is it still a, a series of cock-ups as far as you're concerned? I've been far less critical of the investigation um, but uh, my criticism has been focused on the very poor messaging that, that they've done. So, yes, I'm sure that there will be many within the Lancashire constabulary that will feel that their working hypothesis was vindicated. And if, if we park it for a moment that it was the public that found her, yeah. in that regard, they were absolutely right. Uh, there are, of course... When they said all the evidence pointed to that working hypothesis, it would have been extremely helpful in terms of closing down speculation if they told the public what that evidence was mm. in an early stage. But, of course, we know they really suppress the truth on a lot of matters. Um, and when, when you try and do that and it comes mm. out later and the public know that well. you've been forced into a corner and that's why you release information, it, it attracts a lot of criticism. It does. And, and by the way, look, I, and I say this with my eyes wide open as somebody who is in the media and has been talking a lot about the Nicola Bully case, and I, I am aware of, of, of that, OK? I, I can't help but wonder whether or not the family who are angry at media speculation and are angry at maybe the way the manner in which they've been approached for comment as well, which appeared to be the key theme for the statement, the family statement there, naming a couple of other news organisations, saying, leave us alone now, we asked to be left alone, and saying it was very, very insensitive, OK? Actually, should they be quite angry... I'm not absolving everyone in the media here, but should they be quite angry at the police for creating, with their communication, a situation where the press were speculating to the extent that they were and almost, in a way, hanging the family out to dry by getting their communication wrong. Peter, your, your views on that? At the moment, my thoughts are with everybody who loved Nicola. They must be in the grip of unimaginable grief and, of course, they have my absolute sympathy for that. In, in, all, in due course, perhaps, after there's been an inquest after the inquiries into the police actions have been held and everything has been laid bare, I suspect then might be the time yeah. when Nicola's partner makes us fully aware of what he thought. Yeah. Um, he may, in fact, be interviewed at some stage as part of the, the coroner's process and as part of any mm. review that is conducted into uh, the Lancashire Police's, not only their investigation, but their handling of the flow of information. And the uh, the review into the investigation, I hasten to add, was due to be carried out by Detective Chief Superintendent Staples. And she was the lady that read out the statement from the family just a few minutes ago. Peter, you've mentioned a bit about what we can expect next. So there will be an inquest into this. And in due course, presumably, we will find out maybe a bit more about how Nicola ended up in the river, 
cause of death, etc. How do these things normally pan out? Yes, we will. What will happen is that the coroner's inquest will be opened possibly as early as tomorrow, and then it will be adjourned. And then the detective work really still carries on. Um, there's a lot to be done because a coroner's court is a very important and very high court. In fact, it's almost the most powerful court in the land. And all the evidence will have to be eventually presented at an inquest into Nicola's death so that the coroner and any jury that might be hearing the case can reach a proper verdict. So there's plenty of work left for the police to do. Mm. This is far from over, and I expect that the coroner's inquest, as I say, will probably be opened and adjourned as early as tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, frankly, one of the big questions, if not the big question, actually, confronting police now will be whether or not there's any foul play involved at the moment. And, I mean, how on earth could the police be able to tell that. Clearly, they didn't think initially that, that there was, did they? <clears throat> no, indeed. But there will have been, or there will be, a very thorough forensic examination of any clothing that might have been on the body. The body, of course, will be subject to the most close examination by the pathologist during the post-mortem. And let's remember, these pathologists are very highly trained people. Mm. And, of course... I'm sure it will be the pathology that gives the cause of death. There may be other matters that we simply don't know about at the moment that will come out at some later stage. But what I can absolutely guarantee is that each and every fact that is discovered that may currently be unknown to the media, to the public, um, will eventually be laid bare at the inquest, whensoever that is held. Look, Peter, thank you very, very much. Peter Blexey, I'm just going to ask you if it's all right just liaise with my production team when I uh, move you to one side. Now, maybe just hang around for us if that's OK, because I'd probably like to come back to you. I'm just going to go live now, though, to GB News' northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper, who was watching that press conference in person. Sophie, thank you very much. Just recap, if anyone's just joining us now, watching or listening, what's just happened, what you saw? Well, Patrick, a ch Assistant Chief Constable Peter Lawson in the last 15 minutes has sadly confirmed to us that the body pulled from the river wire yesterday was indeed the body of missing mother of two, Nicola Bully. He also said that the case is now being handled by HM Coroner. Of course, this is the news that nobody wanted. Um, he then handed over to Detective Chief Superintendent Pauline Stables, who read out a statement from Nicola Bully's family, who were, of course, reacting to the most horrendous news anyone could ever really receive. Um, they said in the statement uh, they will never forget Nicky, because how could they? Uh, they were also quite critical of some media outlets. Two were named in particular. They said that their privacy has been invaded and that they asked that they now be left alone. And of course, they'll want some time to grieve for, for Nikki. Uh, I think the most poignant bit of the statement came towards the end. I'll read you just a little bit. Mm. Um, Our hearts truly break for others who have missing loved ones. Keep that hope alive. Finally, Nikki, you are no longer a missing person. You have been found. We can let you rest now. We love you, always have and always will. We'll take it from here. Now, that line there... You have been found. We can let you rest now. This is, of course, the news that nobody wanted, but perhaps it's now going to allow Nicola's family, her partner, her two children, the opportunity to grieve. They know where she is. They know she's at rest. There's no more worrying uh, in the search for her. They have her. Uh, of course... This, this investigation is not over. We, we still have plenty to come and we will, of course, be bringing you all the latest updates on this. But just to reiterate, finally, we now know the answer to the question, where is Nicola Bully? The police have now confirmed mm. to us that she was pulled from the river wire yesterday. OK, look, Sophie, thank you very, very much. It's Sophie Reaper there, who's GB News' northwest of England reporter. Sophie was at that press conference. We just brought you that live here on GB News. And a body, the body that was found in the River Wire in Lancashire is that of missing mum of two, Nicola Bully. It's worth remembering that Nicola, 45 years old, went missing initially on Friday the 27th of January. She was walking her dog Willow on a footpath. She just dropped her two kids off at school and she was walking 
by the river in St Michael's on the Wyatt Lancashire. And since then, it's just been uh, a, a massive mystery, hasn't it? An absolutely massive mystery that's seen unprecedented levels of police resources, even an independent dive team. And I think initially it was just the absolute mystery of the whole thing, wasn't it? She was on a works team calls and people were saying, well, hang on a minute, could no one have identified exactly where she was there? There was so much information confusion, at times misinformation, that was surrounding this particular case. They were told initially she was wearing a Fitbit. Presumably that meant that we were able to track her movements. It turned out that Fitbit wasn't synced to Nicola at the time, so people couldn't tell exactly where she'd been or what she was doing. And all of this gripped the nation. Then there was the hunt for the key witnesses, wasn't there? Those key witnesses came forward and the police were revealing them, well, we got nothing out of them, basically. No one had really seen her. Then we were told, weren't they, well, actually, there was only one way out of this particular area in this area of land that wasn't covered by CCTV. They then had ring doorbells, dash cam footage of people who were in that area at that time, and they found that there was no sign of Nicola. But then later on, it emerged that there were actually three blind spots, and people were saying, goodness gracious me, what could have happened to her? Has she taken herself off somewhere? Has she indeed been taken? And this was fueling a lot of the speculation, wasn't it? Because all of this stuff was going on live, and every single time we had a police press conference, it just seemed to get even more mysterious. Then it culminated, really, didn't it, in the police revealing that they went really big on the search for Nicola Bully because there was, well, underlying issues, significant issues, they were saying. And then everyone got in touch and even, supposedly, supposedly, even people who knew Nicola, supposedly friends of Nicola, were looking to sell stories about her. And that's why they say they were forced to come out and then admit that she had issues with alcohol, which is not nice for anyone to have to have admitted about them. That then shone a light, unfairly so, on her relationship with her partner, Paul. Paul, for what it's worth, who is a partner, said that they had to deal with horrendous speculation about not just their relationship, but it's even people saying he was in some way involved in all of this, being misquoted family members, being vilified was the comment that we just had there from the family. They were vilified online um, by just ordinary members of the public on Twitter, etc. But uh, I'm going to bring you an up-to-date version of this statement now. We heard from Lancashire Police moments ago, and this is what Assistant Chief Constable Peter Lawson confirmed about the body in the river yesterday. It has been formally unidentified as Nicola Bully. Here is exactly what he had to say. I'm going to read it for you now. Sadly, we are now able to confirm that yesterday we recovered Nicola Bully from the river wire. Nicola's family have been informed and are, of course, devastated. Our thoughts are with them at this time, as well as with all her loved ones and the wider community. We recognise the huge impact that Nicola's disappearance has had on her family and friends, but also on the people of St Michael's. We would like to thank all of those who had helped during what has been a hugely complex and highly emotional investigation. Today's development is not the outcome that any of us would have wanted, but we do hope that it can at least start to provide some answers for Nicola's loved ones who remain foremost in our thoughts. Now, those answers are going to come in due course, and those answers, of course, are going to be things like, frankly, how did she end up in the river? What happened there? What was the cause of death? But there are bigger questions here, ladies and gentlemen, and there are numerous inquiries that are going to take place and are taking place right now. And those bigger questions are, how can a police force with this amount of resources at their disposal, drones being used, dog being used, specialist dive equipment being used, the, the sheer number of human resources, both on land, as it were, and in the river, how could it take so long for them, well, to not find a body? Because it was a dog walker who found the body in the end. So there's a big question mark there over the quality, frankly, just of the search and investigation, so a quality question. But there's also a much wider human and communications question, which is also going to be answered. And Suella Bravman, our Home Secretary, she's intervened on this. She's saying, I need, to, I need to have answers as to why on earth intimate details about Nicola Bully was actually revealed. And I'm going to go now to have some thoughts, some of your thoughts, on the sad news that Nicola Bully's body has been identified, and this is in the inbox right in front of me now, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Deborah says, Lancashire police have had to deal with constant onslaught of second-guessing from media, public and so-called experts, which has blurred the lines, and this proves 
let police just do their job? That's going to be a big question going forward, isn't it? Are Lancashire police now vindicated? What about the person who was in charge of that independent dive team? There we go. Look, thank you very much, everybody. Sorry to leave you on such a sad note, but that is, of course, I leave you with the breaking news that Nicola Bully's body has been identified. I've been Patrick Christie's. I'll be back again tomorrow at 3pm. Hello, my name is Rachel Ayres and welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. Well, tomorrow is going to be a dry day for many with a few sunny spells around and remaining still quite mild. Now, most of this settled weather is due to this high pressure that's still around across most of England and Wales. Though looking further north, we have got some weather fronts that try to push in through Monday and into the start of Tuesday, just bringing us some outbreaks of rain and drizzle to end the day. There will be some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle, mostly over western upslopes as well well through this evening. Otherwise, it's going to be a dry night. Quite cloudy though, so temperatures are going to be remaining pretty mild once again with little to no frost around for the start of Tuesday. So it's going to be another cloudy start to the day to the tomorrow, little in the way of brightness to start the day, with outbreaks of rain continuing across the far north of Scotland. And these could be heavy at times. With a freshening breeze as well, it's going to be feeling pretty cool here in the wind. Though with the cloudy skies elsewhere and limited brightness, it will be quite a mild day elsewhere, with temperatures generally sticking around in the double figures. But looking to Tuesday evening and into the start of Wednesday and it's all changed with this band of rain making its way south and eastwards. And this marks a change to some slightly cooler conditions. So that rain will make its way southeastwards through Tuesday night and into the start of Wednesday. So remaining generally dry to start but cloudy ahead of this with some rain building in towards the early hours of Wednesday. Behind this, though, blustery showers and clear spells moving in, which means we could just see a patchy grass frost to start Wednesday here. That rain will continue to make its way south and eastwards throughout the start of Wednesday, bringing some outbreaks of rain. These will mostly be light, but we could just see the odd moderate one in there as well. Behind this, though, brightening skies, freshening breeze, though, with some showers too that could be wintry over high ground. Continued through the rest of the week, though, that we'll see some bright spells and some outbreaks of rain, but temperatures getting cooler. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know.